So like I said, we're talking about, we're touching on the wisdom wing, which is all the nuts and bolts of basically Buddha's teachings that apply to the first part of our practice, which is working with ourselves. So, the, you know, this nice analogy, I find it's a way that you can express, you can frame all the Buddhist teachings. But I find it so powerful in many ways. A bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion, you know. So the compassion wing is really the point. In other words, if, if you know, if you, you know yourself, you want to, if say you want to learn about, learn about accounting, the purpose is so you can help others with accounting. If you want to learn about diet, the purpose is so you can apply it and help others. You learn, you learn music so you can help others. It always comes down to passing on your knowledge. So you've got to have the knowledge first. It's sort of obvious. So you, how can you do the compassion wing? How can you help others with music if you can't play music? How can you help others with healing if you can't have the wisdom of healing? How can you help others with accounting if you don't, know, if you don't have the wisdom of accounting? It's sort of obvious. So the wisdom wing is where you put yourself together, where you sort out your own mind as we've been talking. First, the first level of practice, control your body, control your speech, get some discipline over your berserk behavior. And then why would, this is again the crucial point, why would you do that, remember? Why would you do that? Because that's preventing you, that's causing you suffering. This is, something, this is a very interesting point. Like I where it began this morning, I mentioned a couple of points that show the difference between, let's say, the Christian spiritual teaching approach the, and the, or the, the, the philosophical approach, if you like, of Buddhism and the Christian one, and indeed the materialist one. There's these three, if you like. So the crucial difference in the, um, like I mentioned briefly when we talked about karma, the crucial difference between the Christian one, for example, or the, or the Muslim one, for example, both creators and the Buddhist one, like I said, there is no boss, there's no creator. There's no person running the show. There's no person who's the source of the universe. Buddha would assert there isn't. It's his view. There is, therefore, there's no one who bl- to, there's no one who creates. Therefore, there's no one who punishes or rewards. And that's a very kind of the, the view we have very strongly. It's like that. So the very view of morality and ethics is very interesting. I have a Jesuit priest friend, and I asked him, please define a sin. And so this is the point I'm making. He said a sin by definition. Is an, is, is an action that you do that goes against the will of God. That's a pretty powerful concept, meaning God is the boss. God made the universe. God made the laws. God made me. So then God is to be obeyed. And then if you don't, you will be punished. This is logical. It fits. But what's fascinating, you look at our materialist world. It's exactly the same. Our view of morality is this dualistic view of punishment and reward. So in my mother's household, when she says, don't do that, and I'm a smarty pants and say, why not? We know her answer because I say so. Why don't you go 70 miles an hour? You kind of know it because you might get killed, but the real reason is you don't want to get caught. Are you seeing my point? We have this view very deeply. That, and therefore, being a good girl, you, you're doing the good thing. and You want to be rewarded. We won't go around being good every day if we don't get rewarded. And we, why do we try to hide doing our naughty things? Because we don't want to get punished. So it's a very deep view in our minds already. But the Buddha's view, there is no concept like that. This is a crucial point to make, you know. It's, it's actually enormous. Buddha says the same as Jesus. He says, don't kill, don't lie, don't steal. He says the same as your grandma. It's the same as the police, the laws of a society. You don't kill, don't this, don't that. But the usual reason, and certainly from the Christian point of view and indeed the Muslim point of view, is because God says so. This is a really powerful point to hear. The Buddha says exactly the same, don't kill, but not the same reason. Because he's not a creator. He's not the boss. He is not a punisher. He is not a rewarder. He is an advisor. And this is why it's shocking, you know. To hear it. But that's it's in exactly the same way. If you go to your doctor and she says, don't smoke, Rabina, you might get cancer. Well, you don't say, how dare you say, tell me what to do. You mean if I smoke, you're going to punish me with cancer? Who do you think you are? You wouldn't say that. Equally, when you go home and she's not there, you don't go, oh, my doctor's not there. And then you bring out the Marlboros. I won't get cancer because she doesn't see me smoke. We wouldn't say that. We would be laughed at. Because we know it's a natural law and that your doctor is your advisor. We know there are natural consequences to the body of doing certain actions that could cause sickness. We get that and we don't think of it as punishment and reward. Well, Buddha is exactly the same. And I mean exactly the same. He says we create our own suffering. We create our own happiness. We, he's an advisor. He's not a boss. He's, and that's a massive point to be clear about. That's why that I told you the Lutheran guy in 
Kathmandu was shocked when I when he heard about karma. Why isn't there anarchy among Buddhists? It's a really powerful point. So, of course, initially, when you're a little girl, you need mummy to tell you not to go near the fire. Why not? It'll burn you. No, because I say so. That's powerful. But can you imagine here I am nearly dead, still not going near the fire because mummy said so? You will feel sorry for me. You get my point? The real reason is because of the natural consequence that fire will burn me. So that's the Buddha's approach to morality, that he says, first of all, he defines a negative action as one that harms another. This Jesuit priest friend said that's also the same with Christianity. Natural law does play a role, but what makes it really, what really makes it negative is because God said it's it's God's law. That's powerful. But the Buddha, there is only natural law. There is only natural law. Okay, in a monastery, you've got rules to live together. That's like Buddha's law. That's like mummy's law in the house. They talk about natural negativities. A natural negativity is killing, but not making your bed, you know, when your mummy says so. That's not, a natural, that's not even a negative action. It's what mummy's rules are. There's a difference like that, isn't there? But from the Buddha, there's, in terms of fundamental morality and ethics, it's a natural law. It's nothing to do with him. He simply points it out. This is a really important point. But we think of it as punishment and reward, like this guilty little girl inside us. We hear it like that. Well, that's the dualistic view of ego, Buddha says. We, we all have that view. We've made it up. So, then the very first level of practice, like we've been talking in the wisdom wing, the very first level, you know, if you're familiar with the Tibetan packaging of the teachings, you know very well, you've got the junior, you know, the, the, the lower scope of practice, the middle and the great scope. That's the two wings. The first one's junior, you know, I like to call it junior school and high school, a very simple concept. Even as Holiness said, it's like the education system, the way they structure the, the teachings, you know using these medieval phrases like lowest scope and that kind of business. So the first level, what we're talking this morning so far, we touched upon briefly the concept of karma, but the main one we've been talking about is the way the mind works, the contents of our mind, you know, learning to distinguish between the neuroses and the good parts. This is the crucial job. But And the reason why, this is the point, is not because Buddha said so, is not because you just want to be a good girl and get rewarded. That is our view of morality, even in our ordinary life. It's very interesting. It's because it's a natural law. And that's the point that Buddha's making about karma and the mind that really takes us time to see that every millisecond of what we think and do and say, that is the process of producing ourself. Every millisecond of what we think, do and say produces our future experiences. That's it's like programming ourselves every moment. In just the same way, like I mentioned before, if every millisecond of what you think and do and say in relation to music and playing the piano, you know is the process that produces the musician and you're the one who produces the musician. It's the same here with virtue and goodness and negativity and neurosis and anger and killing and lying and stealing, this so-called morality stuff. The Buddha's saying the stuff that we do that harms others harms us, first and foremost. That sounds shocking to us. It sounds like, oh, that's just being selfish. But that's the part that we don't see because we don't think my mind plays a role. We don't think it matters what I say and do as long as I don't get caught. And I think the cause of all my suffering is, you know, is is Douglas. Buddha says, no, what we think and do and say is the, is the, the source of the person I become. And the stuff that happens out there are merely catalysts. There's a really profound point and we have to think about it carefully, you know. So we are really the boss. We're in charge. And this is why at the beginning stages of practice, and rather than having guilt and shame and I'm bad, it would, it would demand that we have compassion for ourselves, realizing that if I kill and I lie and I steal and I bad mouth and I terrorize and I'm a junkie and I jump, jump on too many girls, when I, you know, and I have too much cake, which sounds like just moralistic, then you realize you're you're harming yourself. But that really takes time to see. That we produce ourselves, you know. And that is a profound realization first. And out of our own self-respect, who wouldn't want to become familiar with your own delusions, your own fears and your own dramas because they're breaking your heart. They're harming you. And then on the basis of these, you do dumb things with your body and speech that harm others. This is all the inner work we have to do first. Then we kind of grow up, you know. We become accountable. This is the general idea of understanding your mind and understanding in general these laws of karma, which just touched upon very briefly. <clears throat> this is huge. Then, as obvious, on the basis of this, 
what are the consequences? Even, even, even a little bit, what are the consequences? Well, the consequences of learning to subdue our body, speech, and mind, learning to become intimately familiar with our own stuff, is, is self-respect, contentment, less neurotic, less uncontrolled, less self-pity, less misery, less anger, less depression, more wise, and naturally more kind and more compassionate. This is the logical consequence. Who wouldn't want to be like that, you know? But we have to experience it as that. So again, it's reminding us that Buddha is, a, is, a, is an advisor, like a good doctor. He is not a punisher. He is not a rewarder. There is no concept like that in Buddhism. These are simple words, and we kind of vaguely know it, but we don't really pay attention to it. We don't join the dots. <coughs> So then, of course, you get into the minefield of being in a relationship. It's easy enough if sitting in the mountains doing it on your own. It's easy. Well, the drama starts is, you know, because we're so caught up in all our attachments and anger and fears in the relationship with Doug Leash, in the relationship with whoever it is, it's like this minefield that we can't, we don't even know how to navigate. Because the, the biggest one is we can't tell our bit from the other person's. And then secondly, because we have this deep view that he is the cause of my happiness and the cause of my, the cause of my suffering, it's really hard to distinguish between what goes on in my mind and his act, distinguishing between what goes on here and what, and what his bit of it is. It's very hard for us. But this is the huge job to do. So let's just use the, use the you know, again, the analogy of let's, you know, me and my boyfriend, Doug Leash, let's say. The very first level, let's say I'm no, no practitioner, just an ordinary person, full of attachment, full of neediness, full of fears, ordinary person, like the rest of us. Assuming that finding a partner is the cause of happiness, assuming getting the right job is the cause of happiness, assuming having the right body is the cause of happiness, assuming that having a good reputation is the cause of happiness, all these things that we know. And don't hear it as moralistic as if you're not supposed to have it. No, as many boyfriends as you like, honey, as much money as you like. That's not the issue. Is our misconceptions about the role of the outside world. That's all Buddha's saying. So the normal view is, you know, the ordinary, needy, b completely believing that the boy is going to be the, in whatever it is now, the, you know, we're very flexible these days, it can be boys, it can be girls, it can be who knows what. I'm just joking. <laughs> so in my case, the boy, let's just say, because like I said before, attachment is this bottomless pit, you know, this dissatisfaction that's an emotional hunger. And then it's very specific to you, like the fisherman boy I mentioned, he was attached to killing fish. The poor old torturer was attached to torturing. You know, maybe I'm just attached to having cakes and a boy, let's say. You know, at least we can be grateful we're not attached to torturing and killing. What a relief. Wow. So this attachment, this, this dissatisfaction... It gives rise to the to the emotional hunger, then the then the searching for the object, then the manipulating to get, then the exaggerating of its deliciousness, and the manipulating to get it, and then the expectation that it will give you the happiness you want, especially when it comes to a person. This is where the minefield is, and then the possessiveness as he's mine, and all the all the other dramas. All that is a function of attachment. In within that, there's also called love and compassion and developing a relationship and being kind to each other. That's fantastic. That's the valid part. And if that part wins over your attachment and your anger and your jealousy, that's the cause of a good relationship. That's the point. But it's a minefield. And this is where, if I'm in the, so the first mode is I just assume I've got to have a partner. I'm nothing if I don't. I get the partner, all the neediness, all the possessiveness, all the expectations, and that's attachment energy. So then when we understand these so-called three poisons, like I said, you know, the ego grasping, the deepest delusion, this misconception of I that runs everything, then it gives rise to this neediness and this hunger, which effectively is the day-to-day -day one. Then that gives rise, as I've been saying, to this third one, which is simply called aversion. So thinking simply in the ordinary daily life, forget the deepest one. You've got attachment and aversion. These words are so cute. We do not talk about these in modern psychology. But this is, the, this is the central piece of Buddhist psychology. And even these simple words, understanding them more profoundly, is huge in your ability to know yourself well and then to understand your partner and everybody else, I tell you. And then again, these, these give rise to all the other dramas, the jealousy and the, you know, the pride, the low self-esteem and all the rest, you know. So these two are primordially deep and the attachment is the main one. So what's attachment? The most simple level of saying it is, is this constant energy that's always looking for the delicious thing. So when that object comes, you go, ooh, ooh, that's nice, and you go towards it. Aversion is when you come across the object that is not what attachment wants, you go, uh-uh, go away. Isn't it? 
So this aversion, so aversion is a response when attachment doesn't get what it wants. Attachment is the default mode, like the motor that propels us throughout the day, really deep down. The second it doesn't get what it wants, the mind gets distressed. You know, so it's uh, so there's a whole spectrum of aversion, you could say, all the way from volatile anger. Now, that was my style. Like I said, my mother didn't have to teach me. The millisecond I did not get what my attachment wants, v- anger would rise, shout, yell, kick, scream. Do you understand? That's an extreme, an obvious extreme example of aversion. And that's the extreme level, and that's called anger, speaking simply. So, but there's a whole spectrum of this, in, this, this aversion. Then there's milder versions of anger. And that's we all have those in day-to-day life, and we don't even think of them as a problem. And they're called annoyance, irritated, upset, frustrated, stressed. That's aversion. That's how you respond when your little attachment, the little girl or boy inside you didn't get what it wanted. So we stop in our tracks and get upset, annoyed, irritated, frustrated, stressed. Anxiety, all variations of this are all variations of thwarted attachment. And that could mean attachment is not just, oh, I want chocolate cake. It's simply wanting a nice feeling every moment. Which means we want the nice weather, the nice sound, the nice taste every second. We want to get exactly what I want every second. That's attachment's job. And the more we have that neediness for things to be the way I want it, the more easily we will get upset when we don't get it. It almost seems like childish to talk this way, but this is the actual energy of attachment and aversion. But we don't pay attention to the aversion until you want to kill Daglish. Or until it turns internally, it's from anger, violent anger, to mild anger, irritation, frustration, annoyance, stress, anxiety, worry, all these dramas like chewing the dog like chewing the bone like a dog, to turn internally to profound depression and despair. That's the entire spectrum of aversion, which is the response when attachment, this little perky part in us that wants the, the baby in us that wants to get what I want every millisecond. But our trouble is, we notice it when it's extreme anger, or then one day, 20 years later, when you can't get out of bed one morning because you're inert from depression. Oh, I must be depressed. But it's taking you 20 years to notice. Because remember, it takes that long to come to the surface. Because we don't pay attention. So it's only when the wheels fall off, as I'm saying, that we even notice this stuff. And that's the problem. That's the problem. And we're going between this attachment and aversion, I think, a thousand times a day. And most of the time, because it's only mild, we, we don't think it's a problem. I mean, it always sounds like a joke. It seems hilarious. <clears throat> if you think about it, it's a simple example. When you're washing the dishes and you, and, you, and, you, and you break your cup. The stupidest, simplest, meaningless little action. But look at how we respond. I don't think anybody in this room would say, oh, that's okay. I broke a cup. That's fine. Break another one, darling. It's cool. Every single one of us would be upset, stressed, angry, hurt, irritated, frustrated, guilty. Mummy's in your head still, shouldn't break cups. Are we communicating here? I don't think I've ever met anybody who, you know, when you see the red light, you go, oh, great, red light. I mean, hear my point. Tiny baby examples of attachment wanting to get what it wants. Things don't go the way we want all the time. You, you, you're walking on the street and you, you just bump a rock. We get upset. The tiniest thing, which is when attachment doesn't get what he wants, we get irritated. But you don't go to your therapist, oh, I got irritated today. Well, shut up and go home, Ravina. <laughs> they only want to know about me when I want to kill Douglas. You get my point? So we only want to know to the therapist when the wheels are falling off. But it's too late. This is the point I'm constantly trying to make. Because we are so used to taking for granted ordinary irritation, frustration, worry, anxiety, fears, ordinary level. We don't think it's a problem. It's like ordinary you know, problems with your car. The car. You understand my point? We just don't think that matters. We don't. But what it is is an indicator of what's going on in your mind. We should be paying attention right there and adjusting things while we still can. This is, seems simple, but it is profound, I tell you. So, ordinary person, not thinking my mind plays a role, totally relying upon him, totally invested in the story, totally invested in the future, um, looking at the deluded side, not the valid side. There's goodness and kindness and love and compassion there. That's okay. 
We're not discussing the virtuous side of it, which is what makes the relationship valid. I'm looking at the unhappy side, which we don't pay attention to. So then, now when let's say, let, so let's say, all the, you know, the, the, the honeymoon's over, and I start now to start to find fault. Because finding fault is attachment, not getting what it wants. Now you start to get close with the person who's living in the same bed as him, and now you're going to see, hear the farts and hear the burps, which you didn't before when you go on dates and you all look dressed up and nice and clean. I mean, you get my point. You should be like the aristocrats and have your own separate bedrooms. <laughs> then you'll always see each other in the best way. And I'm not joking here. It's almost for me, we, given that we're all these deluded, unhappy people with our attachments and our aversions, it's almost asking too much of us to have to live naked and raw with another person and all their delusions and their farts and their burps and their snoring. And, I mean, it's really almost like no wonder you're disappointed after a while. Are you kind of hearing my point? It's too much to expect. If you're a holy being who doesn't mind these things and adores anyway, then it's fine. But we're not very respectful to each other. We think because I love him, he's going to see every little fart of mine as if he should adore me even more. Well, it's not fair to him. Back off, you know. I mean, are we communicating here to sound weird. But we have that idea. That I'll have to share every itty, 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 itty bitty little thing with him. I mean, no wonder we get disappointed quickly. I'm not trying to be mean about us. This is attachment's nature. So then I start to get irritated. And then it's going to build up. What? It's not going to go backwards. It's only going to go forwards as I work on it. And then I start to see his faults. And then suddenly his attachment gets a bit jaded. I don't excite him so deliciously anymore. This is the worst, most shattering disappointment. Then I start freaking out. Then I start getting jealous. We all know these and it's a so-called normal. Yes. Panic is arising in all these things. Then you know we're supposed to meet at a certain time, doesn't turn up, and all the stories in my head raging out of control. So, because I haven't made this is the thing, because in this mode, which is normal life, we are complete victims. I, I'm not really choosing anything, I'm not in control. I'm like this little, you know, being pulled from pillar to post by the external events, up and down like a yo yo. One day he says to me he adores me, I'm relieved. Next day he doesn't look at me perfectly, I'm panic stricken because I'm relying upon him. To say and do the right thing every second to fulfill my needs. It's kind of frantic, actually. No wonder we're exhausted. This is normal life. Now let's say I start to work on myself. So in the normal mode, and he doesn't come home on time, I freak out. I sh he comes in the door, scream at him. Then he tells me it's okay, and I forgive him, and we start again. Off it goes again. That can only go on for so much time. But this is the point here now. Let's say I keep starting seeing more faults. Because my attachment before prevented me from seeing him properly. Because it just glosses over and sees a saint. And now you're up close, you start to see faults. And your attachment's disappointed. And then you start to get resentful. It depends on your personality. You become aggressive or you become passive-aggressive. You know, so like, this is the commonest thing, you know. So then, then you start to, like a, a person I met recently, talking about the husband, 30, 40 years ago, who cheated on her while she was pregnant. She still lives in the same house, in the same bed, but hasn't forgiven him. So this passive-aggression. Hasn't forgiven him. And we talk, she comes to the Buddha's classes and we're talking about it, discussing the Buddha's view that guess what, honey, your own anger, your own jealousy is what causes you pain. And the, that's the reason to want to give it up. And the first thing she said was, well, you mean get him off the hook? No. Do you understand? This is how insane we are. In other words, it's so I'm so disconnected from what I'm thinking and feeling. And someone, when I'm freaking out and crying to my friend, I go to Janice and weep in tears. Janice, he did this again. He's cheating again. And she's heard Buddha's teachings. And she says, well, you're a bit, you can learn to get less jealous. And like I said before, like that friend said, what do you mean? Why should I? Get him off the hook. He's the one who causes me jealousy. It's his fault. This is the nightmare of ordinary mind. So then let's say I start to accept what Janice is saying. And I start to think, wow, that's interesting. And dare to have the courage to actually recognize that my jealousy is my mind. And you know what? I might even be able to work on it. This already is so advanced, I can't even tell you. But it's how I try to do that. Already things are shifting. So this may, at some point then, what this means is this. Let's say he has a tendency to look at the other girls. Let's just say. And I've got the tendency to get jealous. So at some point, I've got some choices to make now. And as a victim, you don't make choices. You're like a lemming. You're like a moth going back to the flame every damn time. There's never choice. And this could be in the job, could be in the relationship, could be anything. You hate your job, you hate your boss, you hate it. 
I hate my, and I get to the point where I can't stand ugly. I'm angry. I'm jealous 40 years later, still resentful, bitter, whatever. You understand? But I've not made any choices. And this is the point. When I start to work on my mind, and I do recognize he has a tendency to look at the girls, not sure yet, blah, blah, blah. I've got two choices. This is already so advanced, I can't even tell you to get to this point. I have precisely two choices. One is to stay because I've weighed up the benefits. And I've decided it is worthwhile. I've decided there's something between us that makes it worthwhile. I, I see his good qualities, and this is huge, and I'm prepared to put up with his bad ones. Because there's something there between us, and I realize it's also my good practice. This is a profound decision to make. But we don't even make that decision. We just we like go back like a moth to the flame, continuing to blame. My other choice is if I can't handle it, or I think there's nothing more there anymore, my choice is to go. The two choices, stay or go. This seems so brutal, so technical. But this is the point. This is when we start to grow up. So this person I'm talking about, 40 years in the relationship, start to just discussing all these things, you know. You've got two choices, to give up the jealousy and the anger, the resentment and the bitterness or leave. Which one do you prefer? But neither, both, not possible. And that's the victim. No, I've got nowhere to go. I couldn't do that. No, 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 that will upset him. And no, I couldn't do that. No, no, my daughter will get upset. No, no, I have any money. I'm a bit afraid to live on my own. But so she doesn't choose to leave because all the reasons why she can't leave is if she's a victim of it. And she equally doesn't choose to change her mind. So you live in hell. This is life. This is ordinary people. We live in hell. We don't even know. We, we don't even. So it's like my friends in prison. They can't. They don't have the luxury of leaving. So this is profound, the effect that it has when your back is against the wall and you know you cannot open that door. You know you literally cannot escape. Then you either go mad or you change your mind. And the ones I know, my friends who are Buddhists, they change their minds. This is profound. But we who are not in prison, we might as well be in prison. As if someone's locking you into that job. As if someone's imprisoned you in that relationship. But nobody has. And this is how despairing and hopeless we are. Because we really believe we have no choice. That's the victim mind. So as always, I quote my friend in Australia, who's a Buddhist. She's a grandmother now. And her husband, she discovered years ago, he was an alcoholic. So naturally, you get upset when your husband's an alcoholic and you hope they change. For the sake of the kids and her and everything else. But he didn't give it up. He didn't give it up. So at some point, and this is my point, she realized she had two options. She realized that. So she weighed up the benefits. She weighed up the benefits for the family and the extended family. And by this point, there were kids and grandkids. So she, she weighed, and that means I decide to look at Doug Leach and work and look at his good qualities. Because when I'm angry, you only see the bad qualities. But you have to have this courage to say, okay, he's this, he's that, he's got this good quality, he's kind, he's generous, he supports my salary because I haven't got enough, he, he accepts what I do, he's patient, or whatever he might, he might be still looking at the girls, whatever it might be. He was an alcoholic, but he was a quiet drunk. He didn't vomit over people, he didn't get angry, he didn't get aggressive, he was generous, he weighed up his good qualities, weighed up that what the children and the grandkids thought, they adored him. So she decided it was beneficial to stay, so that means she decided to change her mind. That means stop expecting him to be different because it's attachment that's the junkie that always wants the other person to be what I want. That's our obsession and that's how we are all the time. Attachment is this junkie that wants him to be what I need. And that's, we see the whole universe like that. We see the whole universe through the lens of my needs. If they don't fulfill my needs, they are called ugly and horrible. If they do fulfill my needs, we think they're gorgeous. An event, a thing, or a person. This is samsara. And then attachment is the, da, manipulates to make it that way. And then we put it, and the worst part is we also do it in the guise of kindness. Oh, it's for his sake. Who do we think we are? We're so manipulative, you know, we're so cheating. We're so wicked in the way we manipulate, thinking we're being so noble. So, so, and this is a minefield, and I'll tell you some more uh, ways of seeing it. So my friend, she decided it was best to stay. So she worked on her mind, and she decided to accept his faults and to learn to see his good qualities. This sounds so simple, but it is profound. And again, you listen, this is not Buddha's expert. This is not Buddha. He doesn't own this. Lots of people agree with this. He just is very good at it. That's all I'd suggest. His expertise is this. 
So in either case, you go or you stay, you are the boss, you're in control, you are not a victim. And that, of course, takes courage either way. To leave is almost more hard for some people. But most people don't leave and they don't change their minds. They stay in passive aggression and negativity and resentment and bitterness. And that's the nightmare because you don't even realize your own states of mind are causing you the suffering. You really do believe it is the husband causing you the suffering. This is the schizophrenic nightmare we all live in, you know. There's no accountability. There's no ownership. There's no courage. Therefore, there's despair and misery. It can't be called happiness. This is life. Do we recognize? I think so, all of us. So either way, it takes courage. You see, often the way we leave now is because you just can't stand the side and you want to kill and, yet, and luckily you leave before you kill him. Better than nothing. But we don't leave for a valid reason. We leave because he's revolting and we blame him even more. That's not valid. That's not intelligent. Leaving for a good reason would mean I just can't handle it. It's not his fault. He is who he is. But I can't handle it. So out of intelligence, I will leave. That's a good reason to leave. If you really can't cope with that job, and it can, you simply can't handle it, then you leave not because the boss is a creep. That's a, the bad reason to do something. That's the negative. That's an angry reason to do something. That's not helpful. You leave because you can't handle it. That's incredibly intelligent. But like, if you're like my friend in prison, they don't have that luxury, you know. That's why I always quote that story, always, about the woman I read about. I didn't know her. In Florida, 40 years ago, in the 70s, she wrote a memoir. She was hitching with her husband in Florida with the hippie kids. Hippies, they were hippies with hippie kids. And the, they got two, they picked, I think the story is something like they got picked up by two guys or in the car with two guys and they, and they were stopped by the police and the two guys killed the police and blamed the hippies. So they're on death row in Florida. 17 years she was in prison. Husband got executed. Try and think of that. I mean, look when we get accused of doing something naughty. Look at the pain, the, 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 the outrage, the hurt, the resentment. He was executed for not doing anything, you know. So her story, you can't imagine the suffering. But this amazing woman. Okay, before I finish with her story, I also read at the same time about this man on death row who was also innocent, and, but who, who is what we would call normal. He went completely out of his brain. Right? Screaming daily, I did not rape and kill that woman. So that's what we think is normal. And we would believe without exception that the, the prosecutors, the judge, the unfair people, the jury, etc. caused him to go crazy. On a conventional level, yes. But the Buddhist point as we're talking is that anger, that rage, that grief, that despair, and do not underestimate the power and the suffering of it. We've all got it. This is Buddha's amazing point. We can learn to get in touch with this and we do have the power, if we're brave enough, to change those thoughts. So that's what this woman did. She wasn't a Buddhist. I think she did yoga and things. But I think she had to have, has to have had such incredible emotional intelligence. But this nightmarish situation, lost the kids, fighting this impossible, insane thing when they're totally innocent, and he even gets executed. There's nothing she can do. And she said at some point, I realized I couldn't change anything. But they couldn't take my mind from me. So I decided I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a prisoner, I'm a monk. I'm not in a cell, I'm in a cave. Now we love to hear these things. It makes us it's like so amazing. You love to hear it. But try and imagine the nightmare and the unbelievable intelligence and courage to that degree of changing her mind. Why would she do it? Because she was, who was the beneficiary of this? She, so obvious. But that's what we can't see. Because the, the, vic the, the, the mode of victim and blame and guilt and not fair and poor me and it's all their fault. We, so, we swim in the nightmare of our own delusions, truly believing we have no control. Truly, truly, truly believing that, you know. It's unbelievable, unbelievable, unbelievable. This is huge, huge. Well, this is wisdom wing, people. We're not even talking compassion yet. This is huge. So in my relationship with Douglas, Douglas, Douglas then, if I recognize, I own it, I decide there's something worthwhile here. There's something good between us that's worth it. Which means I see his good qualities. I, I get a more balanced picture. Because when you're full of attachment, he looks like a saint. When you're full of anger, he looks like an evil monster. We all know this. But I get a more balanced picture. And I think there's something worthwhile. And that also means I've got to work on my mind. So this woman, extreme example, did that. 
became a happy human being. Ex- literally, and this is the point. You see, when we say accept a problem, we think it's passivity. No, it is really not that. That my friend, the one in Australia, she decided to stop trying to change, stop. Her attachment wanted her husband to stop being an alcoholic. Her attachment became, you know, would become obsessed with him stopping being an alcoholic and because we see the harm he's doing and then, we, and then our trouble is we don't realize it's our own naked attachment that wants him to be different. We think it's holy. It's his sake as well. We're lying to ourselves. We can have compassion. Yes, but compassion is noble and spacious and empathetic and it truly is for the sake of the other. But when it's polluted by attachment, and this is the minefield, we can't tell the difference. So attachment is the motor that drives all of us. And so we hardly realize it's going to be there. And it, 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 it's frantic to get what I want every single second. So we will manipulate the person to do what I want. And then when they, when they don't do what my attachment wants, anger is what arises, as I'm saying. Anger will arise. How dare he not do this? How dare this? How dare that? And we then start to give all rational reasons. And the thing is, there might be rational reasons. Like the woman on death row, she's got very rational reasons because she was innocent. Her husband got executed. She's going to get executed. If you can't imagine something more stressful than that. But she knew using Buddhist words, that she, her attachment couldn't get what it wanted. She knew that, so she gave up the attachment. She accepted this is reality. And accepting is a profound state of mind. It's not weak. But she continued to work on her, she continued to work on her freedom. She never stopped trying to help the situation change. But in her mind, she decided she couldn't make the situation what she wanted, which is what attachment wants, to make it all go away. So she gave up the anger. She gave up the neediness. She gave up the attachment. She gave up the panic and the drama and the manipulation. That's what she gave up. So then she still needed to change the situation. She wanted the death row thing to go away. So she never stopped working on her freedom, but she did it with a happy mind. Not out of anger, not out of attachment. And the fact is, like with her case, you don't know there's any light at the end of the tunnel. She could have ended up just like her husband, executed. But she, didn't, she gave up the attachment and the anger. And that's where in a certain situation, it might be right that what the person's doing to us is wrong. It is, it is right that if Doug Leash is cheating on me, that's wrong. It's right if a person's cheating on us and not paying the rent or, or whatever they're doing in our house, let's say, or they're not doing what is right, morally right. We, have, we confuse that with our own attachment for it to be a certain way. It's correct that someone shouldn't shoot you for something you didn't do. It is correct they shouldn't cheat on me. It's correct the person shouldn't cheat on me and not pay their rent or whatever it might be. But we can't tell the difference between the, 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 the external event and our own neurotic interpretation of it. So the Dalai Lama, I think, is a great example. And don't put him up in the sky because he's a Dalai Lama. Just because he was patient and cracks jokes about his enemies, that doesn't mean he sat back going, oh, well, put up with it. What the hell? I'm going to accept this nightmare. No, he never stopped, has continues to never stop for 60 years trying to make the situation different. But he didn't get angry. He wasn't attached to it being different. He wasn't neurotic. He didn't manipulate. He didn't get upset. He didn't use valid reasons. Well, I'm, I'm allowed to be angry and upset because look what the Chinese have done to all my people. No, that's what's so powerful. Because our, right now, there is a valid reason to try and make the situation better. That woman should not have been on death row. That's valid. Dougley should not cheat on me. That's valid. But what I've got to realize is my attachment to its being different is the problem, not his cheating. This is what's so shocking to us. It's true what the Chinese did. It's shocking, the Chinese communists to the Tibetans. It's shocking. But also, this is the other point about karma now, which we, is a big picture, massive, powerful one that informs it. When you have the view of karma, that you know you created the cause due to our, due to our past history, due to Jay, 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 uh, Daglish and my past history, and this is not just some interesting intellectual concept that you just joke about karma. It's a genuine view that a person who's sincerely a Buddhist attempts to articulate and use every day in interpreting this situation where I'm being badly done by by somebody. So yes, the person might be cheating on you. Yes, the person might be stealing your money and not paying their rent. Yes, the person might be a pain in the ass to live with. Yes, the person, you are on death row. It is a nightmare. It is wrong. So that's the part that's so hard for us. So when you have a view of karma, you'll be like those young top Chinese nuns. 2003, Richard Gere invited about 20 former Buddhists 
who'd already been in prison, had some experience with meditation, to come to New York to meet His Holiness and come to the teachings. And a couple of people like me were invited who worked with people in prison. It was a very moving day, you know. whole cross-section of Americans, black, white, Puerto Rican, Mexican, male, female, all with their own suffering of being in prison, you know. Injustice, racism, all these things. Telling their stories, all meeting. It was very, and they met His Holiness, had a wonderful time. He also invited two young Tibetan nuns. Innocent, I mean, they don't even kill flies, these little nuns, you know. Whatever, because they're brought up as Buddhists. They're brought up with the view of karma. And this is the thing that's interesting, you know. We know in our world, we're brought up with the view of the materialist philosophical view. Mummy made us, daddy made us, our brain is the mind. And I'm not being sarcastic about it. I'm trying to really show that we so, what we take for granted, which is all the viewpoints we have in our minds without thinking, they inform the way we behave. Of course they do. They inform our behavior. So if you, if these young women coming from the Indian and the Asian tradition of thousands of years of karma being the world view that is second nature to them, just like materialism is second nature to us, you've got to remember that. Then it's no big deal for them. They're brought up with this. So as the little girls, they have the view of karma. It's integrated into their mind. Due to past actions, you get happiness and due to past actions, you get suffering. That's integrated into their mind. Like for us, mummy and daddy made me and the, and the events out there are the source of my suffering and the source of my happiness. No, that's not their view at all. So there they are, imprisoned, tortured, sexually abused, a couple of years in Lhasa. And they were telling about their experiences. And they were in tears, they were sad, but there wasn't anger. And that's quite shocking to us. This is really mind-bogglingly shocking. But let's analyze anger, please. Like we said right at the beginning, all these emotions and feelings we have, which we call feelings like anger, is, is coming from being an elaborate conceptual story deep in, our, deep in our bones. So it's a philosophical position. And what is the position of anger? How dare you do that to me? It is wrong. Like as if there's no cause of it. Like as if I have no cause of it. So it's, you know, you're an innocent victim of this, bad, of this person's bad actions. That's how we feel, spontaneously. Or, and then it gets tricky, especially if the thing the person doing is really wrong. Like stealing from you. Like causing trouble. Like executing your husband. Like cheating on you. Get my point? There's a, what we would say is a valid reason. So we, but we can't, we can't distinguish between our attachment for it to be a certain way and our anger when it's not. We can't distinguish between that and the, val the validity of the action. We're all, we're all confused, you know. So these young women weren't angry because they don't have the, the concept in their mind, how dare you do that to me, we don't deserve it, because they have the view of karma, which is real for them. So there they wasn't anger. That's shocking to us. So they practiced dealing with this nightmare. And then at the end they said, tears in their eyes, one of them said, and of course we had compassion for our torturers because we knew we must have harmed them in the past and crucially because they will suffer in the future from the actions they're doing to us now. That's the basis of compassion in Buddhism and it's based upon this view of karma, which many of us mightn't have and that's cool. You don't have to. I'm just explaining. So this is huge. So there's Douglas cheating on me, doing the wrong thing. It is true. It's wrong. It's not in our contract. We promised we wouldn't cheat. He's breaking his contract. But then I've got to make some decisions. It's, if a person comes, you know, and lives in my house but makes a mess and whatever it is, we have a contract. It's true. We do. But then, as Buddha says, if you can change it, kindly change it. But what if you can't? Like the death row one. Like the Tibet one. Like I could ask him to stop cheating and he won't. So what if you can't? Then what? Two options. Two options. You leave or you stay and you learn to deal with it. Okay, if I can have him chucked out of the house, that's fine. I can try that too, or couldn't I, if I decide it's my house? Because that's complicated. You could say you have three choices. Chuck him out, leave, or change my mind. I can't change his mind. I could try and chuck him out. That means I've got to get the police. Then I've got to put restraining orders. It could be complicated. You get my point here. I'm talking about practical choices. So this is where we mix attachment. This is where we now mix our own attachment and anger with compassion. We get all kind of confused, you know. Why don't you leave him, Rabin? He's ridiculous. Oh no, he really loves me. I know he does. Or oh, the poor thing. I don't want to upset him. You know, he doesn't mean it. So I go back like a moth to a flame, continuing to suffer, continuing to get angry. So you know, and so or let's say I have an alcoholic brother. 
And I see his suffering. I see his suffering unbearably. But what we don't see, using our models of the mind in the West, what we don't see is I do have that compassion and I am true and seeing his suffering is really true, but we do not see that our own attachment, which is this junky in us that can only bear everything to be nice, we don't see that our attachment is really upset and it becomes aversion and irritation and upset and annoyed and angry because how dare he upset my apple cart by not giving me my attachment what it wants. So we can't see that. We just think it's all compassion. So I stick my nose in where it doesn't belong. I try to manipulate him to go to the AA thinking I'm being so kind. Oh, it's all for his sake. So I butt, I butt in where I'm not needed. I invest. I, in, I intervene where it's not helpful. So I am, I've got some compassion, but it's polluted by my attachment and my anger. But I, I'm too scared to see that. I don't want to own that. So I think I'm, I'm being a nice person. And then I feel guilty, especially if the, if the poor alcoholic brother is really caught, you know, suffering a lot. Then I feel guilty. And then I go home and I complain and get angry about him and talk about him behind his back all the time. And it's that one alone. We never stop talking about the person causing all the problems. So you're growing the fire all the time. You're like pouring oil on the fire, talking about it constantly. Then you feel guilty because the poor man's suffering, the poor alcoholic brother. Look at him. Then you get all conflicted and not sure because we can't distinguish between our own attachment and anger and our compassion. So how would you be, in other words, if you didn't have attachment? Put it that way. How, about, how would we be? You'd, you'd see his suffering. You'd know that you know, mum and dad are upset because you know, you're upset. You'd see all that, but you'd recognize it's his suffering. And you have the wisdom to see that he doesn't want your advice and he's not ready to change. So then you will learn to accept it. Like the alcoholic's husband of my friend. She realized he wasn't going to change. So she knew she had to do some changing. Leave if she couldn't handle it or go or, or change her mind. So she decided to accept it and change her mind. So guess what? She'd become happy. He still drinks every night, three bottles of beer, four bottles of wine, doesn't vomit on anybody, generous, kind, loving, and then again the next day. But she accepted it. That's, now, that's hard. Accepting you're on death row and your husband got executed, that's hard. Thank you. That's a massive practice. Massive practice. So it's a, it is a minefield. So accepting my brother's an alcoholic, having compassion for him, but if my attachment is not there, then I won't get upset. I won't get irritated. It won't offend me. I won't get mad at him, pretending I'm being compassionate. I'm not. I'm just getting angry because my attachment's not getting what it wants because I can't stand the, you know, him you know, upsetting everything, uh, making my life unpeaceful. Because attachment is a junkie that only wants nice things. Attachment only wants that everything to be pleasant. Attachment is a junkie that only can bear the nice things. So it will manipulate like crazy, looking like compassion, looking like kindness, to, to, to manipulate the external world to make it the way I want. I know it sounds brutal, and it is, and it's really advanced not to be this way. So don't you know, beat yourself up. This is how we are, you know. It is a minefield. So to know our own mind is absolutely fundamental. And like we're saying here, you can't begin to know your own mind if you don't discipline your body and your speech. And this is why even in daily life, like with the alcoholic brother, if you made a decision to never open your mouth to anybody else about him, you don't, but we never stop raving on about this person who's always causing our suffering. So we're, we're putting oil on the fire every single day, complaining about him, criticizing him, angry with him, Oh, yes, dear, I know your poor thing is suffering. Manipulate him to change. If we stop doing even that, the speech, if we shut our mouths and accept it, this is how my brother is, and mind our own business, even that would make us more peaceful. We can't even control our speech, you know. So Buddhist teachings sound so cute and simple, but they are profoundly difficult. We really begin to understand it, you know. So to, to, this is why, if you want to distinguish between compassion, you know, the, the virtuous qualities and the non-virtuous qualities, which sounds so boring and kind of simplistic, a way of dividing the contents of our mind, this is Buddha's unique approach. And if we don't understand this properly, how can we say we're really being Buddhists? We are not. You don't have to be a Buddhist, but if you say you are, we to learn the Buddhist model of the mind and get some at least minimal understanding of the distinction between the, the ego-based, neurotic, eye-based attachment and aversion. And if even you understand these two alone, I'm telling you, your view of yourself will be profound. You'll understand everybody else as well. This, this is, it seems simple on the face of it, but these states of mind are profound in the way they function. And remembering that aversion is the response when attachment 
doesn't get what it wants. This is shocking to say. That's what I'm saying. Even the mildest versions of aversion, irritated, annoyed, upset. What do you mean by irritated? It's when something comes along that your attachment doesn't want. It's really obvious. Even the slightest wrong flavor, the wrong taste, you know? Because I'm attached to food. I went out to dinner last night and I wanted fried rice. I mean, I'm very attached to food, right? And I saw the rice come, it was crummy rice. My mind was annoyed. I mean, it's really obvious. Do you understand? I had a fantasy in my mind of a, ta- of a nice fried rice and it came with really lumpy few peas and a bit of carrots. Do you understand? Annoyance arose. I mean, you, you have to be obvious and don't kill yourself because you feel guilty, but notice it. There's something as tiny as that, you know. So if I don't work on that level, how the hell can I work on the level of juggling, being, you know, cheating on me? No way in the universe. So start with the small things, people. Start with the little things first. Start with putting up with, you know, the fart. Start with putting up, the, you know, dropping the cup. Start with putting up with the baby thing, the food not being what you want. Then when it comes to the big things, you're ready, you're practiced, you're ready before the wheels fall off, like I said before. But you see, because we don't pay attention, I just think not getting the food you want is normal. Because if you didn't have attachment, you wouldn't have aversion. That's the point that's so shocking. If you didn't have attachment, you'll still see the rice as crummy rice, but you won't mind. That's the point. You'll laugh and accept it. So it doesn't mean you lose your wisdom just because you've given up attachment and aversion. No, you haven't lost your wisdom. You still see it's bad rice, but you won't mind. Do you understand? But we think if you give up aversion, you give up anger and give up attachment, you've given up everything. You've lost the plot. No. You know, not at all. You've got to use intelligence. It is not good rice. Conventionally speaking, from a professional point of view of fried rice, it was, num- it was zero ten. It didn't, win the, it didn't win the prize, I promise. But you won't mind if you haven't got attachment. It's sort of obvious. It's obvious, you know. So this is easy stuff but profound, I tell you. So then what, let's just say that I'm really mean to my alcoholic brother and I push and push and push and I'm angry with him and resentful and complain and upset and still have compassion for him and then he goes and, you know, let's say then he goes and kills himself or something. Now what's going to happen is I'm going to be extreme, I'll go to the other extreme and I'll blame myself and I'll kill myself. This is called guilt and that's another version of aversion, it's internalized anger. Guilt is exactly anger. Look at anger. Doug Leash, you did that and you did this and you did that and you're a bad person. Well, now what's guilt? I did this and I did that and I did this and I'm a bad person. And the point about all the delusions is that they embellish the truth. There's some semblance of something there. When Doug Leash, you know, left the toilet seat up. You understand? I hear men leave the toilet seat up. I noticed in Harvey's house he's got two sons. Are we communicating? Just tiny baby things. He leaves a toy. So that's technically it's an action he knows I don't like. So he tries to put it down and he forgets. So that's, a, you, oh, you put the toilet seat up. You, you, you forgot to put it down. That's a fact. But if I've got lots of attachment for the toilet seat to be down, I'll have lots of anger for it to be up, won't I? Naturally. So then I'll, the, the bigger the anger, the more ugly Doug Leash will appear and the more he is a bad person. Well, that's exactly what guilt is for yourself. So they both exaggerate. They exaggerate. So Dalai Lama, His Holiness, one time talking about the purification practice. The four opponent powers, these four steps, you know, which sound again so cute when you read all these little religious things, regret, all this business. And it's really profound the way the very first step is regret. So regret basically is this attitude of acknowledging that you did something that wasn't appropriate that is going to cause you suffering. And you regret it because you're sick of suffering. It's really like compassion for yourself. It is literally compassion for yourself. But because we're imbued with ego grasping and all these ridiculous delusions and guilt and anger and all that other rubbish, when we do something that we think is not good and then we, and what we do is have guilt. So somebody asked His Holiness the difference and it's very profound this. His Holiness said, guilt, you look into the past and you say, I did this, I did that, I did this. And then, as I said before, then you say, then you conclude, and I'm a bad person. So what you're doing is you're taking those three, four, six, or one, or 90 actions that you did in fact do, let's say, and you're painting the whole of yourself, aren't you, with that action. Now, we know that's not logical. That's what delusions do. 
So it's not a valid conclusion. You are not a bad person. Do what the Christians say. I think it's very profound. Criticize. Don't criticize the sinner. Criticize the sin. That's intelligence. So if you play the wrong note while you're practicing piano, you don't say, oh, I played the wrong note. I might as well kill myself. I can no longer play piano. That is completely insert, absurd and extreme. So you isolate the action and you recognize that, in fact, you did do it. So now that's regret. Well, what's regret, as Holiness said? is the first part's the same. I did do that. And be accurate about what you did do. Not more, not less than you did. Your piece of it. I did do it. And then say, and now what can I do to fix it? That's what regret is. It's wholesome. So, of course, the crucial point here is that regret um, is acknowledging that I did do something. And you don't exaggerate the thing you did. You be honest and accurate. And then because you know, and this is the point about karma, that the the seeds that action has planted is continuing to nourish in your mind will bring suffering results to you. And you know you don't want that suffering. So you be very precise about it. So then, of course, you go quickly, what can I do? Where's the doctor I can turn to to give me the antidote? This is precise. Now, even with anger, it's very interesting. Martin Luther King said, it's all right to be angry. He meant it's all right to find fault. There is racism. There is suffering. There is a war. That's fact. That's not criticism. That's fact. But then you say, what can I do to help? That's compassion. But what we do is, there's racism. All those evil white people, how dare they do that? Should ca- hang them too, blah, blah, blah. We, get, we add anger on top. Anger is an extra, extra bonus we put on top of the bad thing. Guilt is an extra bonus thing we put on top of the action I did. So we have to be intelligent and wise and accurate. I did eat that bad food. Not, oh, I'm going to kill, I'm going to, I'm a bad person, I ate poison. And every day you get sicker and sicker, I'm a bad person, I ate poison. Don't be ridiculous. Kindly do something about it. So the whole regret one is based on the concept of karma, which is Buddha's view is that every millisecond of what you think and do and say sows seeds in your mind that will ripen as either your happiness or your suffering. Do I want suffering? No. Well, I better go take the medicine. I don't want, you know, I don't want suffering. It's an intelligent thing. So own the action if we did do it. But often with guilt, we exaggerate. And this is the problem to say, I was thinking of my mum, you know. Mums love to take responsibility for all the problems in the entire house. But that's, excuse me, it's very arrogant. I remember my mother really in dis- would suffer so terribly. There was lots of dramas in our family. Of course there were. But I remember feeling really infuriated with her because she, was, she felt there's all this guilt as if she created all the problems. And I remember being infuriated, sort of, mum, excuse me, hey, I played some role in my life, mum, back off, let me have some responsibility. Because guilt wants to take all the responsibility. I'm such a bad person. It's just self-centered ego. It's just a reverse, it's like, you know, miserable self-pity me ego instead of big fat special ego. It's over-exaggerating your role in it. But be accurate. If you did do something that's wrong, take responsibility for it and then see how you can fix it. You might, you you know, if you kill somebody, you can't make them come back to life. But you can purify the seed that you planted and you can vow not to do it again. And that's the powerful process. And that's why regret is so powerful and necessary. Very wholesome. So if we, you know, were like with the, with the alcoholic brother, you know, I was angry, resentful, how dare he, blaming him for making mum and dad upset, blaming him for everything else, and then sort of trying to struggle to be compassionate. So I've got to own my bit of it, own that I mightn't have killed him, he killed himself. I could have been part of it, that's really powerful to think that. Could have been, don't know. So what can I do? What can I do? I can't bring him back to life. My poor alcoholic brother. Let's say, let's just say, you know. But I can regret my part of it, my own delusions, my own bad speech, my own this, my own that, and and see the suffering that I know I don't want. And then deeply have regret, which is like compassion for myself. And deeply, then the second step is have compassion for the people I've harmed. The second step is compassion for those I've harmed. Have enormous compassion. For if I have harmed, if I've harmed them, and maybe I didn't harm them. But if I, those I have harmed have enormous compassion for them. And then you do the practice of purifying, and then you vow to change that's the powerful one 
when you vow, I will never do that again. It's like a wake-up call. It's like a learning. And that's really what practice is. It's like we learn from our mistakes, you know. That's the wholesome one and grow stronger from it. But this is where guilt and despair destroy so many of us, you know. Because we actually don't think we can change. This is the tragedy of our culture. We just really don't believe we can change. We believe it's too late. It's all done. That's why my friends in prison just love the, the purification practice. Because, you know, I've killed people. I'm a monster. I might as well kill myself now. No, nothing. There's nothing we can't purify. And that's why it's so powerful to understand dependent arising and emptiness because that's the underpinnings of all of this. There's no karma. This beautiful book of loving issues, like I said, Mahamudra, that's coming out in September with wisdom that I edited. So blissful, this book. You know, how to realize emptiness, how to meditate properly. So beautiful. But how there's nothing we can't change. There's no, and that's the Buddha's view. There is nothing in our mind. There's nothing in our mind, no matter how negative, that we cannot change. Nothing is set in stone. Nothing is concrete. Nothing is unchangeable. There's nothing we can't purify. This is what should give us courage. And it's logic for the Buddha. Because consciousness itself is, in its, in its, is naturally pure. Virtue is, tr is truly who we are. It's like if you, I like the analogy of water. H, water is two bits of H and one bit of O. Is it not? H2O. So H2O is the substance of what we label water, isn't it? But we know you can have really polluted water so bad that it would kill you if you drank it. But even without being a scientist, we know that that stuff in the glass is not H2O P P97. No, the pollution is an additive. The pollution is adventitious. The pollution, even it would kill you, is there, but we know it's not in the nature of the water. This is the point, and it's logical. So anger and grief and jealousy and bad actions we do and negativity and attachment are not at the core of our being. This is Buddha's fundamental starting point. This should give us incredible courage, incredible humility and patience because it is not, you know, we, whereas we in our culture and ego naturally thinks it, that this is who I am. This is at the core of my being. Buddha's view logically is that it's not. They're like bells and whistles that we've added on. The delusions are adventitious. This is a massively powerful point. But ego thinks it's natural. And so we identify with those delusions and we make them bigger than they are. This is a tragedy, you know. So it's really true. We're our own worst enemies in this way. So even understanding intellectually the Buddhist teachings about how mind is naturally pure. Sounds cute. We like the sound of it. But it should give us great courage when we come to our problems, you know. Because this is a tragedy of attachment. So when attachment is getting what it wants, we call that happiness. Everything's great. Everything's lovely. I'm under lucky, under fortune, lovely house, lovely this, lovely wife, lovely thing. Everything works nice. I've got money in the bank. Attachment is getting what it wants. We feel all perky and happy. And then we naturally we think it's going to last forever. This is the thing. I always quote here, poor old Nicole Kidman. I always apologize for saying this story first to Nicole. But... Because I read about the story when she was still with Tom Cruise and she was with, uh, in, I read about it in Vanity Fair when she was still with Tom, whatever that was. And she said, we will be together until we're 80. So what's happening here is, because they were all blissfully happy, attachment's getting what it wants. So we add another delusion onto that because we can't, attachment can't stand the thought of not having what it wants every second. We jump on top of that a quality called permanence. It will last forever. So because, you know, like because they were together and things were beautiful, she said, we will be together until we're 80. That's a lie we make up. We add that on top. There's no certainty, unless you're clairvoyant, that anything will last forever. But, but, but because it fe because attachment is getting what it wants, we're so overexcited. We truly believe, now I found happiness. It'll last forever. Now, my point is this. When, attach when the bubble bursts, and Tom left her, in fact, I think it was for Penelope Cruz or something. I'll read all the papers. <laughs> Look what happened. The bubble burst. Attachment was shattered. And then, the, and then aversion, despair, despair. Depression, aversion, when attachment stopped getting what it wanted. And now what happened? When you're in the despair, you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, can you? 
because now you think that is permanent. Now we, now you think that despair and misery will never end. That's why we kill ourselves. Because we think things, as well, on top of all the lies, we think things are permanent. On top of attachment, aversion, all the rest, we also put this other lie. As Lama Zopa says, delusions, all these neurotic states of mind, that are, these are absurd nonsense, these delusions, these exaggerations, made up by our minds. As P Ramachet puts it, they decorate on top of what already is there. Layers upon layers upon layers of characteristics that just aren't there. So really what we're trying to do as a Buddhist is distinguish between facts and fiction, you know. And the facts are the virtues. They've got some, their virtuous states of mind that just sounds like a holy word. They're valid because they're, they're connected to dependent arising. When there's compassion in your mind, you see the person suffering, you empathize. And it's valid because it's connected to dependent arising, which is how existence is. It's related to reality and it's empathetic naturally. Your own sense of I encompasses the other person and you have a sense of connectedness with them. That's the positive states of mind are like that. They're valid states of mind. The negative states of mind are completely neurotic. They're utterly self-centered. They're completely eye-based. They're panic-stricken. And they've got no relationship to reality whatsoever. So they're the cause of the nightmares. They're the cause of our suffering. And they're the cause of the things we do with our body and speech to harm others. The virtuous states are relatively valid. They're totally valid only when we realize emptiness. And they, they help us benefit others. So this distinction between negative and positive sounds so cute initially, but it really is profound in the meaning when we understand what Buddha is saying. You know? Like I said, we don't think this way in our modern world. We think of, we'd never use the word judge, negative, positive. It sounds like judgmental. We can't stand it. But Buddha is it's a huge and fascinating view. You know? And this is our job, to be, have enough inner awareness, be our own therapists, work in this workshop of ours to distinguish all these facts from the fictions. And this is a massive job. And we can't do that, like I said, until we've subdued our body and speech to some degree, which means living in our vows. If we're a practitioner and we've committed to our lamas, and I'm just saying only if you have. If, you, you know, if I'm living, if I'm committed, if I'm committed to Daglish in a relation, in, we did a marriage ceremony and we, were, we, we commit face to face with witnesses I will not cheat on you I will not do this I will not do that we've committed we've taken like a vow then if I can ge genuinely try to keep it throughout our relationship that keeps the relationship pure but look at the schizophrenic if I start to cheat on him and lie to him and do all the things behind who are you harming only yourself so if I've got commitments for my t to my teachers when I take initiation when I take my body type of vows when I take my lay vows if I've got a commitment I did a commitment I shook hands with the Dalai Lama when I took a commitment with him I shook hands with Lama Zopa and I signed the contract that I will do my part, which is not kill, not lie, not steal, take my, keep my tantric vows, do my practice every day. I've checked a few boxes, right? Like I did with, with Doug Leach. If I break those, whom do you think you are harming? You're poisoning yourself. You're making yourself schizophrenic. You're destroying yourself. But we're so arrogant. You know, we don't, we don't even notice that we're harming ourselves. We think, oh, I'm not going to be told what to do. As if someone else is forcing you. No, you chose it. You did it. I committed to him. So I, keep my, I put my money where my mouth is. No one forced me to take initiation. No one forced me to take bodhisattva vows or tantric vows. No one forced me to marry Daglish. I chose it. So I keep my part of the, of the, of the deal. And if I, have to, if I have to leave it, then leave it and be honest. If you can. Now, with our commitments to spiritual practice, we hear all about the, what the lamas say. I mean, we've got to think about that carefully. So keeping, living in vows in general is said to be super powerful. The Buddha would say vows are so potent, they've got like a visible form that's visible to clear, a form, it's like subtle form visible to clairvoyance. There's something really marvelous about keeping these vows. They say with karma, for example, with karma, the, me the very meaning of the, the beginning of the process of creating karma, quote unquote, is the, is the thought, intention, volition, I will. So we need in our mind bucket loads, say, of good, rich, delicious, intentional karmic seeds of non-killing, non-lying, non-stealing, the, the lay vows we first took. So if you don't have a vow 
to not the Buddha would say that when you have a vow to not kill let's say every second you're keeping that vow even when you're not thinking about it you're ticking over virtuous karmic seeds and putting big powerful seeds into your virtuous karmic bank vault every second even when you're not thinking about it this takes thinking about it we haven't thought about this stuff before and given that by the end of this life we need bucket loads we need a delicious bank vault full of delicious strong intentional non-harming seeds then it's easy peasy falling off a log easy to accumulate all those seeds by living in vows of non-killing because otherwise if you don't have a vow to not kill it's only when you have the conscious intention to not kill when you meet the ant you don't at this moment we're not killing anybody are we but we're not thinking i will not kill because there's no creature who's demanding we not kill it it's only when we meet the creature that we say i will not kill whereas if you have a vow not to kill 24 hours a day you're keeping it, you're ticking over virtuous karma. So vows, Lazama Zoba says it's not enough to be a good person. By keeping vows, it's so potent and so easy to tick over the appropriate karmic seeds in our bank vault, such that when we die, there are plenty there for us to continue practicing in the next life. Bodhisattva vows go from life to life. They're incredible. So marvelous to reinforce these. And then, of course, the tantric vows, the main ones, the, the top ones, the boss ones, the big ones. We need all, all those levels. So to have to honor these commitments, you know, is incredible part of our practice. To honor these commitments, to keep our word of honor, to to do our to do the wish, to, to just keep our keep our word of honor, keep our word basically, you know. And we're grown ups. Because there's no punishment, there's no reward, no one does it to us, no one's forcing. We're the boss. We're in charge of our lives. Anyway, blah blah. Any questions, people? <laughs> Any questions about anything? About what? I, yes, go, go. Uh, I have a question I think that we would all ask you. A bit loud, sweetheart. A bit louder. A question I think we all want to know the answer. What's that? Where was this horrible rice? Can't hear you at all, sweetie pie. Where was that horrible rice? <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear you. Where was <laughs> that horrible rice? What rice? The fried rice. <laughs> the fried rice. Fried rice. Fried rice. Fried rice. Right. So we can avoid it. We can <laughs> we have an aversion to bad. Yeah. I have no idea. I know you were, darling. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm not very learned in the practices. Sure, though. darling. Go there. Okay. Um, when I think about, and I think I'd like to think that a lot of people here feel the same way, um, beyond Trump, beyond politics, there's some pretty major things happening globally. There are, yes. Environmentally. That's exactly right. That are very disturbing. That's exactly right. And I think that the ability to use... And I was talking with my Yes, day. yes. The suffering that you feel at that realization beyond yourself yes. is very motivating. That's right, exactly. Changes, but how do we connect together? Uh -huh. What do you mean connect together, darling? Well, if other people feel the same way, yes. and yes. Buddhism is sort of like about sort of the outer realm, this uh -huh. ability to consciously connect. I'm getting a bit lost. Can you keep it simple and give me a question? Is there a way, do you think it's possible yeah. that if enough people allow themselves to have those feelings that things can get better? Uh, what's your thought? What do you think? Have you seen evidence that it's true? Uh, that depends on what the... Have you seen evidence that it's true? Even examples that that's possible? Well, that's what I was saying. When the media allows us to have... No, never mind the media. Have you seen from your own experience that if a bunch of people get together, you can, you can, you can uh, achieve things? Have you seen it possible? There's been strides, but then... So, it's, in other words, it's hard, isn't it? Yeah. So, what's your solution? You, is, the solution is to never give up, isn't it? I guess so. That's it, darling. So, have no fantasy expectations. Don't live in a la-la land. See the suffering. Have compassion and never give up and do what you can based on wisdom. Beautiful. And thank you. But I guess also what I meant to say was, is that progressive as a Buddhist? Are you allowed to do that? Or by whom? Allowed by whom? All right. Is it ego? Is it the ego mind? It can be. It's up to you to, to work it out. It's up to you to make it virtuous. It's up to you. We have to. That's why we have to know our minds well. But never give up's the key. Absolutely. Well done. Who else, darlings? Somebody else. No. No questions whatsoever. Where? Yes, darling. Um, how can we cultivate uh, good? Speaking habits yes. in daytime, like throughout our day. Yes. How do we do that? Uh, I'm a very talkative person. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I understand, darling. But it's sort of, I mean, I, I, it's kind of, it's like any, learning anything. It's like saying, well, obviously the first step has to be the decision, doesn't it? And you have to, and the reason you'd like to do that would be because you can see some benefits. Would that be true? You have to, if you, you, why would you do something if there's no benefit? What would be the benefit of doing that? For you, as you've heard, basically, what what do you think you the benefit of this? I don't know if I've figured out the benefits yet. I can see the disadvantages. What are the disadvantages? Uh, talk what are the disadvantages of talking? To talk nonsense. What's the disadvantage? <coughs> um, I feel bad after. Oh, okay. Why do you feel bad? Because I'm talking nonsense. No, no, that's no reason. Why do you feel bad? Because you, you feel nervous about maybe people mightn't like you. That's another discussion. Because you, you, you suddenly you feel self-conscious. That's because you're attached. We all. Uh, this is another reason now. This is because we're all attached to people liking us. So that's usually the most the most reason we because we're attached to being seen as good girls. So there's, that's one. That's at least for your own self-protection, maybe. But the bigger one is that the key one, the key one at the very first level of practice, which is Buddha's point that whatever you do and say and think is the process of producing yourself so if your words if you let's say i'm not saying they are but if your words are uncontrolled and rabbit on about nothing and say bad things about people and then whom do you think you're polluting myself that's right there you go that's the first one that's the first reason for your own sake for your own sake to realize because because if you're trying to work on your mind and if your speech is always berserk how can we get to have a chance to see our mind if the if the speech just dominates that's because it's the expression of the mind isn't it that's why it's first level of practice control the speech control the behavior it's a huge one but to, and it's not easy but there's nothing wrong with if you if you, even if you're conscious that you do talk a lot there's a good side to that because you're friendly and people really like friendly it's lovely to be friendly so even that much don't regret the whole thing but if you're saying harmful words or negative words or bad words about other people or just vomiting it out because you're compelled to talk because you feel nervous if you don't that's to look at a bit but if you're just being friendly hello how are you that's that's called compassion sweetheart so don't chuck the whole baby out with the bathwater i think that's where i'm, I'm a little bit uh, stuck is to make that just that only comes from that's and that's the tricky part that's what practice is that's what learning to become familiar with what is valid and what is not and that's what's not so easy so that's why i really appreciate what you were saying yes about the village understand and, and and to develop that clear seeing that's right exactly darling so just keep moving keep learning keep checking and don't throw the whole baby out of the bathwater i've got little post-its like silent <laughs> vigilant there you go well done girl you're on the you're on the right track you've been doing you're doing great <laughs> who else people any other questions? Yes, yes, where? Yes, sweetheart, go. Um, what is um, the most workable advice that you've given to um, an inmate in prison um, that worked? I don't give any different advice. It's ex and I'm not trying to be silly here. The words I'm saying here are exactly what I say to my friends in prison. There's not a single tiny fraction of difference. Maybe the difference is always in terms of if we're if we're on the listening side and looking at our situation, how seriously we take it. Do you understand? I don't ever speak anything different. It's exactly the same. Whether you're on death row, whether you're living in the multi million dollar house with five husbands. Do you understand? <laughs> the same advice is the same. Truly, truly sincerely. Who else people? Any questions? Nothing. Yeah. So yes. Is this our life purpose? The life purpose is to develop the two wings of the bird. You could say, put yourself together, get less neurotic, less fearful, less clear, less you know, less confused, less unhappy, less depressed, more wise, more kind, more content. That's pretty good already, isn't it? And then naturally, on the basis of that, because the reality is, we live interdependently with others. Would you agree with that? Aren't we intensely social beings? So that's logic. That means everything's interdependent. So the more we put ourselves together and stop feeling like this poor, self-pity, isolated little me that gets badly done by, do you understand? And the more we loosen the grip of that, and then we become naturally more content and then naturally more spacious and have a sense of connectedness to others and naturally have, want to be useful. It's a simple way of putting it. So usefulness is compassion, exactly. isn't it? Useful, being useful. Keep a simple word for it. Useful is compassion. That's all. Being useful. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. That's it, to the degree that we're capable. Until, of course, Buddha says we can perfect, eventually perfect it and become a Buddha, Sangye, fully developed, one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time, yeah, exactly. Does that make sense? 
That's why I like the two wings of the bird analogy. It's really nice. And be humble about it. You don't, you don't have to go off and be like Mother Teresa or something, you know. Or go and be like the, to get a Pulitzer Prize for the best cancer treatment or something. Help according, help the dog, help the ant, help the next door neighbor. Do what we can, each one. Put the toilet seat down yourself instead of complaining. You know, simple little tiny baby things. Do you understand? The small, it all, the small things. Start with the small things and the bigger things get easier. Do you understand? Yeah, okay. People, anything else? So, okay. You've got to ask me some questions. Sorry, come on. It's your, you guys have got to ask me some questions. I've said enough. I mean, I haven't, but it's now your turn. Anything, anything at all you like. Just come up with something, please. Yes, sweetheart. I, I mean, it's more of a curiosity of your opinion, but this whole situation in Myanmar. What, darling? The, the, no, just ask me a question, sweetheart. Keep it simple. Ask me a question. The, the, I don't the, want Buddhist, the Buddhists that are harming... They're terrible. I know. It's awful, isn't it? So what's your question? How does that fit into the Buddhist philosophy? It doesn't fit at all. It's terrible. Please. Well, so what? So then, what's the what, so then? What's the point? What are you asking me for? I don't know. I was curious. Your Darling, of course, Buddha doesn't say kill and harm and hire. Of course, he doesn't. Just because you call yourself a Buddhist doesn't mean you're a good person, does it? So you should check very carefully before people even give Buddhist classes. They might be maniacs, isn't it? <laughs> what else, people? Any other questions? You have to ask me questions. Sorry. Yes, Lynn. Mundane and practical. When are you coming back? Oh, I have no idea. But I'm still alive next year, I think. August, so August, alive, September, yeah. January, somewhere like that. August, summer next year. Okay. Janice. Any recommendations for how to deal with the ebbs and flows of practice? What do you mean? I mean <laughs> that sometimes I'm very conscientious about my practice and other times... Yeah, it's very easy. I understand attachment. Yeah. The only reason we don't... The, if we understand attachment which is a junkie in us that wants pleasant feelings all the time, right? So when we understand, okay, so then when we understand that, okay, in the, in the, in the, uh, okay, in the Bodhisattva path, they talk about attachment at a subtler level. So I have this weird phrase, when I first read it, I thought, what are these people on about? This weird concept called the eight worldly dharmas. I had no interest in these strange words. So we look, unpack it. It's an, all it is is, a, is another way of framing how attachment functions. This main mental illness that we've all got, the Buddha would say. So it's... This is basically at this level, we see, like I've been talking in a way, attached to this assumption, this frantic assumption that I must get what I want every second. This is how it is. It's necessarily neurotic, it's I based, it's fear based, and it's really quite frantic. So the millisecond it doesn't get what it wants, that's called suffering. Whenever it gets what it wants, that's called happiness. So there's. There's, then there's, um, there's, so, okay. Forget that one. Full stop, turn the page, another chapter. In the Bodhisattva path, on the, the, in, the, in one level of the practices, they talk about the six perfections, which is really the, the Bodhisattva perfecting the two wings together simultaneously. The four, first four, as we know, generosity, blah, blah, all these words, right? They have the perfecting of the compassion wing. You go from life to life, benefiting others. That's not the political wing. You're, base, you're connecting with sentient beings, life after life, helping others, helping others. In our daily life, helping others, helping others. Then in the wisdom wing, the last two, in your meditation, you're perfecting wisdom. You're perfecting the realization of emptiness. So the first of the four is called enthusiasm. Is called joyful effort, enthusiastic perseverance. And it sounds kind of like, what's that? I kind of can't imagine it, you know. But when we hear the opposite, then it's very sobering. So the opposite is called laziness. And it seems very unlikely saying it first, but let's analyze that. So the very first level of laziness, and don't hear this as brutal and unkind and moralistic, you know. Such a simple word. 
is the most primordial, the deepest one, and it's called I can't be bothered. So now, what is the thing we can't be bothered doing? It's really obvious. It's the thing that takes too much effort. And what that is, is the thing that attachment it's, out of, it's basically the thing that's outside attachment's comfort zone. And what takes too much effort is the thing that you're not familiar with doing. And because attachment can't stand anything but nice feelings, then naturally you'd rather sit back, put your feet up and relax and watch telly than even make the effort to do five push-ups. You know? I'm just using an ordinary samsaric analogy because it takes too much effort. You've got to puff and pant. And attachment only wants to be comfortable. It's a complete junkie that only wants pleasant feelings. So the first most obvious one is attachment to just being in your comfort zone. Pleasant feelings. So of course you won't make effort. The second one is much more sneaky and tricky and we pretend it's a virtue. Oh, I'm too busy. I'll do it later. And this is the one we're talking here. So that's a lie. We're not even honest with ourselves. At least if we, if we were honest, we would hear our mind say, I must do my practice. And then we will go, oh, no, can't be bothered. But then we will quickly say, oh, because well, I've got to do other things first. So then we feel noble. I'll do it later, we say. And we lie because we will never do it later. It gets us off the hook and we're lying to ourselves. So what's the thing you're too busy to do? The thing that takes too much effort. And what's the thing that takes too much effort? The thing that attachment can't stand because it's going to get out of your comfort zone. So the third level of laziness is the worst one, the deepest one that prevents us from achieving any goals whatsoever. It seems initially not evident. It's called, nah, not possible. I can't achieve that. So, so here the point is, so I asked before to you, what is the benefit? As the Lamas would put it, and it's very evident, very obvious, if you know the benefit of doing anything, then of course you will do it. But this is what's hard. So forget ordinary, forget spiritual practice. Look at our Dharma. Look at ordinary activity, like going to the gym. You look at the pictures of the gorgeous looking person who's lost the kilos and got the lovely muscle tone. You're so excited because you can see the benefit and you know the techniques are all there and you can be like that. I'm talking ordinary example. You see the result. Wow, I'm so excited, right? You, vis you visualize the end result. You see the benefit. And you go to the gym and you get all excited. And then your second day, you go to the gym all excited. Third day, already you're putting it off. And before you know it, back to square one. Because basically you forget the benefits. We forget, and, we, and that's why even with the gym, it's, it's evident the benefit. But it's, even that is too hard because attachment is such a junkie. We, we don't, I think we don't, it's not, it sounds so heavy talking this way because we just don't notice it. We just take it as normal. But it is the most incredible inertia. Attachment is this massive inertia. We will do anything to stay in our comfort zone. So I walked up to, to Laudo, Lama Zopa's cave up in the mountains, right? 14,000 feet up. So if you like walking up the mountains, and some people who were there on the trek did, I have never walked up a mountain. I've not even walked up a hill in my life unless I was forced to occasionally and I don't do it naturally. So and I'm old now. So I can't even tell you the shock to my system that it was. And when I analyze it, my body was unbelievable suffering for my poor body and my poor lungs. Right? Not to mention the high altitude. But basically, and then when you get up there, it's 10 below with thin walls. And there's no such thing as a heater. I mean, you've never heard of a heater up there. You live in 10 below. You just, that's just how you live in your little freezing house with a thin mattress, right? Do you understand? So that the only reason it's suffering is because I'm attached to comfort. It's very, I mean, some tenant who's lived up for 78 years, she's not unhappy. That's what she's used to. So it's not complicated. It's because I'm attached to my comfort. I mean, we all know this and it sounds so cute and normal, but that's why I was suffering every day because aversion was arising. So the second my attachment didn't get what it wanted, aversion arising. I don't like this. This is really obvious. So that's a, a, a grossest level. Our comfort zone is so, and because we have so much and don't feel guilty about it, that's how we are. So it's really hard to remember the benefits of spiritual practice. That's much more advanced than the gym. Do you understand? But we lie to ourselves as part of our problem. Janice. That's why one time I was very mean to one of my friends. Whenever I go see her, she lived like 25 kilometers from the center in Sydney. And I'd go see her sometimes when I was in that area. And she'd always say, oh, I'm so sorry I can't go to the teachings. I always want to go to the teachings, but I'm so busy with the kids and I just can't go. I'm like the second one. Now, I'm not being rude to her, 
but I, I was mean to her and I said, what if there was a $500 check at the centre? Would you come? And she had to be honest. She said, of course I would. So in other words, when you know the benefit, and I'm just talking about $500 check, she would immediately know the benefit of $500. She'd get completely happy, put the kids in the back, come on kids, let's go and get $500, delight in the drive there and back and come home as if nothing happened. But we don't know the benefit of hearing teachings. We don't know the benefit of going to the gym. We don't know the benefit of doing our practice because it's, it's, attachment overrides the benefit. So it's really not easy, Janice. But don't lie to yourself. That's the worst one. If you just can't say, at least you say, I can't be bothered. I'm too lazy. At least you hear the fault. But we put it, we, we, we get ourselves off the hook by saying, I'm too busy. I'll do it later. And we don't. So that's, but this happens also quickly, but it's not easy. So at least we can be truthful to ourselves. And then the third one, I can't do it, is sort of interesting because it doesn't seem very evident initially. But if we look at the long term goal, Okay, enlightenment, forget even enlightenment. Let's say you're trying to get single point of concentration. Even that's a five-year, seven-year, ten-year job, right, for if you're really advanced. So it fe- right now when you're sitting here 10, 20 pounds overweight and full of no muscle and no muscle tone and you go to the gym and you're exhausted and you come back after the second week and you look exactly the same and you think, oh, my God, I can't do this. It's real and true, isn't it? We really don't see – because we can't see any change yet. But when you know logically – it is true that you can do it, then even though the evidence isn't so, even though you still feel worse even, you will not believe that. You'll believe in this true, it is true. So that's the same with our practice. We just have to persevere. So that's, I like the analogy of a garden. Anybody who's halfway decent gardener knows when you put the, the seed in the ground, you don't come next morning expecting the oak tree. You get my point? And that's part of our suffering because we don't get the result immediately, which is what attachment wants. We get disappointed, so we give up. But if you know it's going to take three, three months, six months, one year to get good muscle tone, then you've got the right timing and you're prepared to work on it. If you know that it'll take 10 years to get this really beautiful garden, then you will rejoice every day when you're sowing those seeds and putting the water on the seeds. You won't be disappointed. So we have all these false expectations. That's our problem. So you just got to – discipline. there's no shortcut. It's just called discipline. But don't, sometimes, sometimes you just get more pleasure from your practice. And then you're happy to do it. But sometimes you won't. It's as boring as tears. But that's a child that wants to only have a good feeling. Because another one of our problems with meditation, our misunderstanding about meditation, we think you've got to get good, feel nice. The junkie thinks, I'm going to have a, oh, I had a good meditation this morning. What happened? Oh, I had tears of compassion for sentient beings. Well, I'm very happy, but that's just a, a boring old feeling coming and going. But if you, so in other words, it's a bit like you go out into the garden and because you don't feel happy doing it, you think there's no benefit. You, I don't, whether you cry or laugh, I don't care. You plant the plant of the seeds. So that's what we never think. We don't understand the concept of planting seeds. We just are so addicted to now and our feelings now. We just want the result now. We're like babies. So when you understand logic and cause and effect, it doesn't ta- – you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. All these profound things our mother told us anyway. But when you know that, you'll do your boring old practice and don't feel guilty. Do it standing up. I don't care. You don't have to look holy. There's no commitment to have your legs crossed and your eyes closed. Do you understand? Know what your basic agreement is and keep your commitment. A bonus is if you feel good. A bonus, of course, it's nice to have concentration. It's nice to have a visualization, but that's just a bonus. At least keep your bare bones commitment and say the boring old words and stop being like a baby that wants a nice feeling. Do you understand what I'm saying? Just do it. Then you keep your, you've kept your commitments. You kept your word of honor. You've ticked the box. That's enough. At least that. So you're keeping the connection going and slowly they will bring results. You're creating the cause. Got to have, then, then, you ha- then you just do it. You just do it. It's like you've got to breathe in and out. You can't forget to breathe. You've got to put a bit of food in your body. It doesn't matter if you have pleasure or not. It'll do its job. You've got to understand that. That's really important. Because we're, but we're so addicted to practice being some immediate special result now. This is attachment talking, honey. And then you go up and down like a yo-yo if you think it's that. It's childish. Do you understand? Because it's attachment running the show. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Thank you. So that's why... If you make a decision every every morning or every night before you go to you do your four opponent powers, you make a decision, you you know, and then you wake up in the morning another day and off you go, you just do it again. Discipline is the key. We're going to get weak. We're going to fall down, pick us up again and just keep moving. And don't get caught up in guilt. That's, that destroys us. Just think, oh, well, what a bore. I'll do it again. Pick us up, just keep moving. Fall down, pick us up, keep moving. Fall down, pick us up, keep moving. There is no other alternative. 
But we just get caught up in our head with all the dramas, you know. Do you understand? I'm sure you ask this question every time I see you. <laughs> every time for 25 years I've seen her, she's asking the same question. It's true. I keep giving the same answer. I'm hoping for a different answer this time. I know, that's right. Something will happen. That's right. <laughs> Good. Okay. Any other questions, you people? Yes, darling. Um, I wonder if you describe the purification process more, and I'm thinking about the detailed description you gave of karma. And yes. Also, the conceptualizations that are instant. Huh? Uh, the conceptualizations that are, that are instant. Yeah, that, that don't even feel. It's just like an instant. What, darling? What, darling? Uh, just things that feel instant. That it's an immediate feeling. You know, you're this, you're that. And oh, I purification see. Purification related to that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not purification related to that, but the general process. Of, ch of kind of given, okay, let's just, given that the Buddha's view is that every millisecond of what we think, feel, do, say, just naturally, is this process of what they call creating karma. It's this process of programming ourselves, like learning, isn't it? So every second you're studying piano, the theory, the playing you do, it all, it, it's part of the process of you becoming a pianist, isn't it? So every time, so that, that's really what the job is. But then let's say you've learned a bunch of wrong ways of playing piano and they're very deeply ingrained in you. You've got to do the opposite process of ungrowing. You've got to you know, change the habits, don't you? And that's what purification is, one way of saying it. So Buddha's saying over countless lifetimes, we've been practicing all the wrong things. And we've got these very deep, ridiculous, old, bad habits. So part of the process is to grow the good habits and part is to purify the bad habits. You get my point? So sim another simple analogy, you've got to grow the seeds, grow the, gr pull out the weeds and grow the flowers. So whatever analogy works for your mind. So the, at the most basic level in Buddhist view about karma, junior school, grade one level, as we're saying, Buddha exhorts us to not uh, do a, to refrain from a few actions. As Lama Zopa says, the most urgent level, first level, entry level, junior school level of practice, the very first thing to do is at least stop sowing more weeds. Put it like that. A few. So Buddha would exhort us not to kill. Consciously, intentionally decide not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, not to cheat on your partner. A few, a seven little, seven little actions that impact upon others. So again, remember the difference. The Christian reason to do that is because God said, and the Buddhist reason is because guess what, honey? By doing these actions, you're going to harm yourself. Are you with me so far? Can you say the? Do you mind saying the seven real quick? Killing, three of the body. He suggests that we don't kill any sentient being. Don't steal. Don't take the ungiven, they say in Tibetan. It's a very direct. Stealing is called taking the ungiven. Don't take the ungiven. And the next one is don't, uh, you know, don't misuse. I'm putting it along. They saw next sexual. It's called sexual misconduct. But if you think about it, it's misusing your body to harm others based on sexual attachment, isn't it? Like raping, like cheating on a partner or taking someone else's partner. That's obviously on the assumption that, you know, that you've got a commitment. If you haven't got a commitment, you, you can sleep around as much as you like. You're not breaking a commitment because you haven't got one. You're just increasing your attachment. That's okay, whatever, but it's not a commitment. So if you've got a partner, you'd commit not to cheat, wouldn't you? Do you see what I'm saying? So then the next four of speech, saying words that aren't true, uh, talking bad things about people behind your back, behind backs like I talked before, creating disharmony, abusive language, you know, abusing others with your mouth, and then just rabbiting on about nothing, like like you're saying, you you think you do, which is probably not as bad as you think. Though you're probably being kind as well. Don't worry about it. Do you understand? Just pouring forth from the mouth uncontrollably, with no interest in whether the person listening is interested. You understand? That's how we are. So okay, so that's the four of the speech, and we can see can do, we can all do we do we all agree that these are actions that harm others, aren't they? Would you agree with that? But the crucial point the Buddha is making initially is guess what, Rabina? If you do these, darling. Because, and I'm going to get to this now, because they're based on delusions, they're based on attachment or anger, you're going to harm yourself. You leave imprints in your own mind. You're programming yourself in those habits. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? So that's the basis of refraining first. First step, at least refrain from doing more harmful actions. Then the next level is now start to weaken the seeds we've already planted before they ripen as my suffering. And that's called purification. Do you understand? The second level of practice is to, I'm saying these words consciously, weaken this, given that Buddha says our mind goes back a long time, 
Given that everything you've said and done and thought up to now, all those seeds are in your mind right now. Were you here this morning? Okay, you heard me say all those things. So your mind is full of these millions of seeds you've planted in the past. Given that some are negative and some are positive, you don't want the negative ones to ripen. It's as if you put all a bunch of seeds in the ground and they haven't ripened yet. You want to get them out quickly, don't you, before they ripen. Would you agree with that? That makes sense? You look doubtful. Do you not understand me? Just know I'm imagining it. Okay. What do you mean? You can't hear my words? Uh, no, the metaphor. I don't know. I'm seeing a visual of a garden. That's good. Good enough. But if you have a, using the analogy of seeds is fine. If you have got a garden and you know that you put all these funny seeds in last week that have because you you misunderstood you put the wrong seeds in. You don't want them to ripen, do you? You don't want them to ripen, do you? You so what would you do? Take them out. That's right, dear. Well, that's called purification. Are you understanding the concept? Thank you. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. I'll get to, yes. Question. So, do you call compassion a positive state of mind? Did you call it? Let's go there later. We'll go back to that. We'll absolutely. If it's not, we're in big trouble, aren't we? What do you think compassion is? No, I was wondering if it is if it's called a natural state of mind or a positive one. Because what do you mean? By, hey, hey, wait, wait. This is interesting. I will go back to perversion in a second. What do you mean by natural? What do you mean by as opposed natural as opposed to positive? What's this distinction? I don't understand that distinction. I was thinking that positive and negative are the ones that you make them. They do not have any inherent existence. Like, But what do you mean by natural? Natural, I thought it means that if the afflictions are not there, then it is there naturally, meaning that it is not... Oh, darling, what are you saying? <laughs> oh, my God. What? Give me an example of what you're calling a natural state of mind. I don't know any natural state. Well, why do you, what do you mean by natural? Say it again. This is right. very fascinating. So, so my question was that... No, no, I have to get you to tell me what you mean by a natural state of mind. What do you mean? You said it so clearly. I, I just thought that it hurt. Never once, no. No, I said that... I said that... Okay, okay, the way I use it is this. The way we think in our own heart intuitively is that anger is natural. Jealousy is natural. So what we mean is that everybody's like it. We're all born this way. You get my sense. So we say, oh, that's just natural. But, and what we mean by, I think, is that you, you would be unnatural if you didn't have it. So then it gives us a sense that it's just normal and you can't be different. I'm saying we think that, which is utter nonsense. Yeah, no, no I meant that I think I heard that by you or others maybe that these are unnatural meaning negative which are unnatural like anger that's unnatural in the sense that i use that consciously meaning that they're not at the core of our being and can be removed but is compassion at the core of our being that's, that's what i'm saying about the virtues that's why buddha says we can develop in sangha like i began at the beginning sung implies the eradication of all the rubbish yeah because they're not at the core of our being. Ye implies the development to perfection of all love, compassion and wisdom, which are at the core of our being, indestructibly so. We can never get rid of those. Can you hear the words? Can you hear the words? That's what I was wondering, because is it just at the core of the being or should you develop it, like develop compassion? That's Okay, well, you're misunderstanding all the words by saying that question, so I'll have to explain it to you. So I'll have to explain it to you. You're saying wrong things. Not being rude, just but you're, technically you're not saying the right words. So I have to explain it to you. Why would there be compassion in your mind for a start? If let's say you, you see suffering and a compassion arises in your mind, what is the cause of that compassion arising in your mind? I think that's something that I have developed by practicing it. Good. You just ask, do you have to develop it? You just asked that question. Yeah, and I think the answer is yes. That's right. You've answered your own question. So then that's why I'm saying that it is not there at the core of my being, but that's something that... Who I said... Developed. What do you mean? What do you mean it's not? I thought that being at the core of your being... What does that mean, do you think? That it's just there, like it's just your nature or... It is, but it is. But right now it's polluted by attachment and anger and neurosis. It's like water, using the analogy of water, it's just a simple analogy, it's pure, clear stuff, and we know it's made of H and O, you know, those chemical components, right, about water. That's pure, clear stuff. It's just a simple analogy for how the mind is. So you also know it can be polluted. Do you agree with that? Water can be polluted? Yep. Okay. So you know you can remove the pollution, don't you? So then you could argue that H2O is at the core of the water. What defines water is the presence of H2O. So that is what is at the core of water. So by the removing of the pollution, 
the waterness is already there. So your pure nature is your is your love and your compassion and your wisdom and your kindness. It's like they are the H2O of your mind. They are what your mind is, but they're polluted right now with anger and ridiculous rubbish. So as you remove the rubbish, the other stuff comes to the fore, doesn't it? And not only do you remove the rubbish, but you can even enhance and perfect that goodness and make it the purest, most blissful water in the universe. Does that work for you, the analogy? Yeah, I mean, I understood what you think and what the Buddhist psychologist says and just what's the doubt then the doubt so that didn't answer your question no it that that was meant to answer your question so how what's not <laughs> clear from it my doubt is that that my mind I think it is pure in the sense that there is no compassion in it and what it darling there's no compassion in it oh what's there's in no it then if it's pure meaning I could be neutral I can see a person not be compassionate. oh that's not neutral that's not the meaning of neutral well, you'd be you'd be you'd be you'd be like a you'd be like a robot if there's only if there was no compassion and, and no delusions there. I thought that that is the huh? core of it. And then what is? What's at the core of it, darling? Being a robot, like no, like no, there's just no nothing like that at all. You can have that view, but it's not Buddha's view. Yeah. So you got some understanding, some conclusion here. Yeah, I mean, that's not the Buddhist view, but I was thinking that that is the core of it, and the Buddhist view is to add compassion and get rid of the negative ones. So if you can add, add compassion to what? To something which doesn't have any... Oh, okay, good, 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 thank you. So how can you... What is the cause of the compassion? If you put, if you're gonna, who's going to put compassion into your mind? Myself. So where do you get that compassion from? I just practice it. Where do you get it from? Oh. Where does it come from? Your ability to have a compassionate thought, where does that come from? Yeah, there is an ability there. Thank you. You see? You just improve the point. Perfect. Do you understand? Yeah. Thank you, darling. Very good. She proved her own point. So any, go back to purification now. Ready? Oh, more, more than purification. We'll talk about the whole thing about karma, okay? So... This is Buddha's, as His Holiness calls it, like it's self-creation, you know. We don't need creating by a creator, and we don't need punishing, and we don't need rewarding, and we don't need policing. Well, we might, but, you know. <laughs> he, says, he says we do fine our own. We make a mess ourselves, and we create our happiness ourselves. We can use support, that's for sure. So, okay. Every millisecond, what we think and do and say is this process of what they call creating karma. Karma means action. It's, it's uh, Sanskrit. Action. And the real meaning of action is mental action. That's the starting point. Everything exists on the tip of the wish, as Lama Zopa says, and that's the word intention, volition, I will. That's the beginning of the process of so-called creating karma. It has to start with intention. But the so we're so programmed with many of the things we think and do and say that it's like a joke to say that. It doesn't feel like intention because we become programmed with all these deep ingrained habits, you know. So, okay, then in order for any action we do, there's four ways that our karma ripens, remember? One is a, what's called a complete action, which will produce the result of a type of rebirth. The next one is a tendency to keep doing something, which is the residual result of having done it before. Then there's the experience of having being at the, being at the receiving end of that action, which is the result also of having done it before. And then there's the environmental result. So the entire universe, as we experience it, we can divide the, the results into four categories, the very way the physical world impacts upon us. And this is the interesting point for you. Where's she gone, the environmentalist? Where is she? She's gone. Oh, okay. Okay. Maybe she can hear me from there. That even the way the environment impacts upon us is a result of actions of sentient beings. It's kind of interesting, you know. Oh, maybe, yeah, okay, I'll explain briefly. Then next is the experiences, the way we impact, the way we receive things, the way people see us and treat us. Because we're very social beings. And remember, if it's, this is a natural law. A natural law means something that no one made up. It's just the way, given the interdependent scenario of this universe, we can discover a natural law called botany, a natural law called mathematics, a natural law called architecture. No one made these laws up, but we can be intelligent and we can articulate the laws, can't we? You know, those clever Arab guys who, who changed from the silly old Latin people from using X's and V's, they used the zero to nine. What geniuses. But they didn't create mathematics. The laws of mathematics have always existed. They just articulated them. That's the point about a natural law. It's really important to understand this. 
So the Buddha would say this law of karma is like that. No one made it up, but he, with his intelligence, has observed the nature of the universe and minds of beings and the way the universe is, and he's articulating that law that he has observed is actually occurring naturally. So he doesn't own karma. There's a really crucial difference, whereas the Christian one says God literally did make up the universe, make the laws. It's a huge, massively different view. Very fascinating for my mind. So, okay. In order for any action we do to be called what's called a complete action, which leaves a seed in our main bank vault, which is the so- which is the one that is triggered at the time of our death, that is the one that determined, in our case from our past death, is the one that determined that our mind would go to our present mummy's human womb and when she hopped into bed with our daddy. Or if you, you know, conceived in a different way in the Petri dish. I'm not quite sure when it joins it then. It's a bit different. So, okay, the second way our karma ripens in turn in this human body of ours, having a human mind, is what's in the human mind itself, our bunch of tendencies. The third way our karma ripens from the past is the way we're seen and treated by others out there. And if we think about it really simply, we, in this universe there are those beings, the poodles, the ants, the rats, the humans, who do nice things to us and who do mean things to us. And they can often change roles, we know that. The third lot are called the strangers who do neither, who, and we couldn't care less about them anyway, isn't it? So we, we can see we're very social beings, starting from conception, intensely social beings. And how others see us and treat us basically is that third way that karma ripens. So the first one's called the fully ripened result, a type of rebirth. The second one is called the intentions or actions similar to the cause, our own in, intentional, you know, our programming, our own tendencies. The third is experiences similar to the cause, which is how we're seen and treated by others. And the fourth is environmental karma. So, okay, in order for any action we do to be qualified as the first kind, a fully, to bring the fully ripened result of a type of rebirth, there need to be four things in place when we do it. And this is the Buddha's analysis for what determines an action as being negative as opposed to Jesus' dis- def- definition of a negative action, which is one that goes against the God, will of God. So it's a very different definition. So in order for this, for, uh, let's just use a simple example. Say Daglish has a, a mouse in his kitchen. In order for that to be a fully, to be a full, to be a, a, a complete action of non-killing, which will leave a seed in his bank vault, which will be one of the seeds that will be triggered when he dies and will then cause him to get a decent human rebirth, let's just say. There need to be four things in place when he does that action. Well, the first has to be, there has to be an object there, a living mouse. The second is his mind involved in it, and this is massive. And there are three bits there. I mean, keep it simple, we could say there could be two. But there's the recognition, first of all, or discrimination, one of the third category of states of mind, one of the so-called neutral ones. This ability in his mind, which is happening every single second of the day. You look around this room, you see light, this pillar, blue, pink, person, cup. It's this capacity to distinguish between this and that. And we need that badly in our practice. That's the key we have to cultivate, the, the characteristic we have to cultivate to distinguish between the rubbish and the goodness in the mind. So this is the ability to distinguish that is the mouse. The second one is intention, bare bones, I will save that mouse. Third one, and this is the crucial piece, and these all happen so simultaneously we can't even see the difference, so we have to unpack them. The third one is is the motivation that compels him, compels his intention, that is the motivation that behind the intention is the reason behind the intention to not to save that mouse. And let's just say it's called compassion. The fourth, the third is, that's three parts of the second one. So one is the object. Two is 2A, recognition, that is the mouse. 2B, intention, I will save the mouse. 2C, motivation, compassion. Three, he will do the action, catch the mouse. Four, release the mouse. A little mouse, happy mouse. Thank you, Douglish. Bye. That's a complete action of non-killing. So it's exactly the same for a complete action of killing. But it, of, course, of course, this is a simple, simple presentation. And we can imagine every single person on the planet, there'd be variations because it's all so complex. We've got to break, break it down to the bare bones, you know. So exactly the same as a negative action. One, 
object to the mind involved. Recognition, that is the mouse. Intention, I will kill the mouse. Motivation, anger. Three, kill the mouse. Four, dead mouse, roughly speaking. So of all those pieces that's most important of those four, the second one is the mind. Why? Because let's say, what's your name? Zach. Zach. Zach has a mouse in his kitchen. Maybe the same kitchen. Is it the same kitchen? Not another kitchen, okay. Okay. So there's in his kitchen and he there's there's an object there. Number one, there is an object. Number two, recognition, that is the mouse I will kill. No, because he doesn't see it. Intention, I will kill that mouse. No, he doesn't see it. Motivation, anger, no, he doesn't see it. Three, his foot goes on the mouse. Four, dead mouse. Zero karma. Because karma is created by the mind. The body and speech are the servants of the mind. They carry out the wishes of the mind. It's got to start with the mind. The body can't create karma. I mean, again, there's so many variations of all this, but we're looking at bare bones, understanding the nuts and bolts of this process, which Buddha would say is a natural, a natural process. No one's up there policing it or running it or punishing or rewarding. There's no concept like that. So you can have all these variations. Maybe Doug Leach is inviting Zach home for dinner and he knows that Zach loves mouse flesh for dinner. <laughs> so exactly the same scenario as before, but the one difference is his motivation, his attachment to eat it later. Oh, I must save this little mouse. Be careful, don't hurt it, so I can have it all nice and fresh for dinner, you know. Do you understand? But it, it might look nice, but his motivation is terrible, isn't it? So he can kill it later. So you can see that the you know the seed the motivation and who you know who's clairvoyant around here we don't see anybody's motivation we have no idea so we really you know as the, as the Buddhists will say don't judge you know it's very hard for us not to do that because we're not that clever so anyway the point is there's infinite variations in this but these are the bare bones of a complete action so that's the main one that brings a result of a type of rebirth you know and then like I said the example of the fisherman. This is why I have such compassion. Been, been suffering realms in the past due to habit of killing that exhausted itself. That karma exhausted itself. Finished. And like a miracle, one of his virtuous karmic seeds was triggered. He gets born to a mummy in, Cal in Northern California. And then he's got lots of tendencies, but because he hasn't purified all the killing karma, he, by vowing not to kill, by purifying killing, the, the sort of like the, the residuals are left over to continue to kill. That's the tragedy. So this is why the other example I always use, my friend Date Chen taking the lice out of her little boy's head and he's crying with compassion for the lice. He's 40-something now. He's never killed a living being. So we can deduce that he had purified his past killing. The moment he meets a louse in his own head, the other little boy, the moment he meets a fish, he wants to kill it. And the moment he meets a louse in his own head, he doesn't want to kill it. And he's 40-something now and has never killed a living being. So we can deduce from these, using the Buddha's logic, that the one person had a tendency to kill from the past but hadn't completely purified it. And this is a tragedy. You've got the human rebirth, but you tip it down the toilet by continuing to kill, you know. So that's the tragedy. But this other little boy, he'd purified it. So he had not only didn't want to kill, he had compassion as well. Because he'd vowed not to kill in the past. And that's why you've got to think Janice the future. We're sowing seeds, you know. I mean, if you really realize you're sowing seeds, you won't care if you feel ugly and depressed and fat and miserable now. It won't matter. You're sowing seeds, baby. We ne it's really hard for us because we are addicted to good feelings now. We're like babies. You know, we're like, what the thing in our mouth, you know? What's it called? We call it a dummy in Australia. Huh? Oh, is it a pacifier? Yeah, we call it a dummy in Australia. We just want, we want quick fix now. That's the depth of attachment. We want a nice feel. And that's why we can confuse our practice with attachment. Because, you know, when you met, because you've got a lovely house and you've got a nice, quiet meditation room and you feel very peaceful and the incense is very nice and there's a very sweet feeling, we judge the feeling. We, we, we determine our meditation by the feeling, which is like infantile. It's infantile. Do you understand? So I, I, I couldn't. Lama Zopa said, when you go to Lauda, because it's his cave up there from his past life, he said, oh, you won't want to come back. Believe me, I wanted to come back. <laughs> Do you understand? So because I felt miserable, I, you don't think it's any worth, worthwhile, you know? Do you understand? Because we're, like, we're like infants. Anyway, so the, the four ways that our karma ripens. So let's use one example. I was talking about I got, I, you in the toilet. And I was going to mention there's four ways. What's your name? What's your name, honey? Me? Yeah, pa baby. Barbara. Barbara, darling. Okay. So we'll use Barbara as an example. So there's Barbara, a human being. You're a human being? 
think so. She's a human. Okay. That's the fruit. Buddha would say that's the result of uh, we're going to use one example of one action of non-killing so the result first of all for Barbara is it must have been at the time of her past death her very strong non-killing habit probably practiced in the context of keeping vows not to kill was the cause of her getting this human body that seed was triggered at the time of her death to go to her present mummy's human womb the next bank vault that was triggered was all her tendencies in her mind her kindness her wish to help others her love whatever she's got good and bad tendencies like the rest of us And then maybe that includes also in her mind no thought to kill. That's from the past habit of non-killing. And that's incredible. The third result of non-killing for Barbara would be that she won't get killed and she won't die young. So far, that's the result. Here's Barbara still alive. The fourth result for Barbara of non-killing is that, you know, The environment is very benign to you. The food that you eat is delicious. The water is not polluted. The air is very pure. Even if you do eat rubbish food, it still nourishes you. So that's the fruit of non-killing. So good environment, Buddha says, from lifetime to lifetime is a result of our non-killing and non-harming in the past. Lousy environment right now, long term, karmically, is from from lying, killing, stealing, harming. That pollutes the environment. So there's a logic to that in the more sophisticated teachings, which I might go into. So then how we purify right now do what we can but the real way to ensure that when you do die and you keep going you need to not kill not lie not steal not harm right now then that all see the tibetans for a thousand years they had this pristine environment there's only like six million people on this vast continent this vast piece of earth they didn't even kill ants you know do you understand? So the environment was complete. They had no such thing as environmentalism because they didn't need to have it because it was natural to them. They wouldn't, even the wild animals weren't wild almost because nobody killed them. Nobody upset the environment. Nobody killed. So there was complete harmony of the environment. It was incredible. But now the utter, that one of the nightmares for the Tibetans is the dis- utter destruction of the environment, slaughtering all the animals, misusing. You understand? So, it's a, so karmically, even for a thousand years, it was a really pristine piece of earth. So due to past practice and you get born a Tibetan again, you're born into an environment that's really pure and pristine. Do you understand? So it's long term. It's very interesting. So, um, okay. So then we create karma. So by looking into the world we've got now, the life we've got now, That's the fruit of our past actions. So now we want to make sure, even if we're not thinking about helping others yet, we're just looking at ourselves. We want to make sure at a very practical level, because we know we want to keep on practicing, keep on doing our path. We want to make sure that when we do die, we want to get another decent human mummy, want to have another decent bunch of tendencies, want to have another decent bunch of experiences, because it does help if people are nice to you and don't lie and kill and steal and rape you. It's a drag if they do. Okay, you can practice, but it will be helpful if we can plan our future, like your garden in the future, by sowing the right seeds now. And including the environment. So you can keep on moving with your long-term goal of achieving Buddhahood, Sangha, you know. So it's practical. It's very practical. Nothing special, nothing holy. Very practical. So that means you also got to, then, the first level of practice, like I said, most urgent, at least don't kill, steal, lie, blah, blah, blah. First little seven things. There's the three others about the mind, but they're the first seven little things. Not that many things to remember. There's probably a hundred things to remember just to drive a car. There's only seven little things to make sure you become a nicer person. It's not many. Then the next level of practice, take care of the seeds you've already planted, the rubbish ones, before they ripen as suffering. It's kind of obvious. So stop, in other words, using ordinary analogy, stop smoking cigarettes right now and start trying to purify your body before the cigarettes you've already planted, smoked in the past, will bring their results. You clean yourself up, don't you? So stop sowing more negative seeds and purify your body now by eating good food and doing stuff to prevent the results of your past smoking to ripen as suffering. It's kind of reasonable. It's logical. And it's for your sake. Don't get all holy about it. Nothing wrong with that. So what's that consist of? Well, it consists of the four R's. Very easy way to remember it. The first, like I said before, is regret. So I acknowledge I killed, I lied, I stole, I badmouthed, I cheated on Doug Leash, whatever got angry, harmed people. I mean, yeah, if you raped and lied and terrorized and dropped bombs as well, we'll regret that too, okay? Whatever, you know, in this life. So it's practical. It's not guilt. It's not shame. It's not I'm bad. It's not trying to avoid punishment. There aren't these concepts. It's practical, practical, practical. I don't want suffering. I'm sick of suffering. Okay, then better fix it up, babe. It's practical. So you, re- you do this regretting. And so first you'd regret the things in this today, this life, bad mouth my husband, kick Doug Leash in the teeth, kick the dog, whatever. Simple. Keep it simple. 
acknowledge. But regret has, like I said before, has got this particular component of being like compassion for yourself. Not guilt. Guilt is neurotic and useless. It's not helpful. There's no action involved. It's just misery. It's just a function of ego, that's all. So regret is acknowledging I did this and said this and said this and did this and then you think and I regret that and then you're talking to yourself why Rabina because you know what honey I don't want the seeds of these to ripen in the future this takes time because we're so addicted to the dualistic view of, of bad and good you know and then you might as well given that you're a Buddhist you, you relate to the idea of consciousness going back and back and back and back then you think and I regret you know what Rabina talking to yourself I regret anything I've ever done with my body with my speech since beginningless time that will ripen as my suffering that means the, the actions I've done to harm others so this mightn't be so comfortable for us sometimes but this includes our lifetimes as animals Buddha would say we've been animals in the past and other beings in the past all just sentient beings you know that takes a while to get a head around but there's all this logic in the Buddhist teachings no time to talk about it so that without being mean to animals they, they, they're much more brutal in many ways than humans humans are more clever we're much more intelligent we do harm in a brutal intelligent way but the, the, the suffering of animals' minds, the Buddhist, the Buddhist psychology refers to all living beings, not just humans. Very fascinating. We're all driven by this ego grasping. We're all driven by attachment and we're all driven by aversion or anger, the three, these three main states of mind. And animals have them a billion times stronger than ours. And why is because they can't access their virtues. They're completely deeply programmed, deeply programmed with enormous fear, enormous suffering, enormous paranoia, enormous stu like stuck in who they are. They don't have the miracle of access to virtue if we're so fortunate to have it and use it, you know. This is shocking to us to hear this. Lama Zopa said one time, one of my friends told me, that if just for a few moments we could have the direct experience of the mind of our precious little dog, the suffering, the mental suffering, would be so intense we could never possibly, would never want to sleep another second and waste this precious human life. That's inconceivable to us. So that's either they're making it up or that is the mind of a yogi who exactly has that experience due to their own subtle work, you know. So, you know, you can regret the actions you've done out of mindlessness, out of, out of programming, out of karma, without, of utter ignorance. It's not guilt and shame. It's unbelievable regret because out of, out of ignorance, we, we, didn't, we don't know. Like even when I was, you know, even just actions we do now, we don't know the consequences. And when you don't know them, you do it out of ignorance. So later on, you get the consequences and you realize I didn't know. So, out of, so you regret it because you, out of your own ignorance, you didn't realize you're creating future suffering for yourself. So it's really like c compassion. So you regret from the depths of your heart. Then you think, and so what can I do about it? Whom can I turn to? Where's my doctor? So here, the concept of Buddha for us is not a creator. He's more like a doctor, more like a person we rely upon whose methods we have chosen to apply. And that's our choice, you know. So that's the second step, reliance. So you refuge, take refuge, whatever. And so when we do this little practice, there's a particular way we do it, all the lamas and all the Tibetan traditions do it, where you'd visualize the Buddha in a particular form above your head and you do a little prayer, refuge, you know. But the idea of refuge is delighted that you've got a doctor you can rely upon, that you can give you methods that you can use to purify your mind because you're the one who does it, not Buddha. Now the second part of this second step, reliance, it sounds curious to call it that here, and it's called, now you have compassion for others. So why they, how they talk about compassion is, is curious in terms of its being a reliance, a relying upon. We rely upon sentient beings. Meaning, the second step is me cultivating compassion. The first one is me cultivating compassion for myself, if you like. It's called regret. The second one is like compassion for others, for those I've harmed. You've got to first have it for yourself. And realize your own ridiculous delusions harm you. Now you've got to realize how you impact upon others, but also how they harm themselves. So you have enormous compassion. So in this sense, I'm trying to cultivate compassion. So it's evident, if I want to have compassion, that means I have to meet suffering sentient beings. I have to know about suffering sentient beings. How can I have compassion if I never see any suffering? So in that sense, we're relying upon suffering sentient beings for me to cultivate compassion. That's the way they talk about it. So the second step in the second part, reliance, is now I think of those I've harmed. 
And this is going to include all the past sentient beings. You know, it's like we're all harming each other. And if you look at the suffering animals, this is not the world's view for sure. Like a whale. She opens her mouth. One mouthful of one breakfast in her long life. 40 million sentient beings get down her gullet. Well, that's a lot of killing, you know. Out of ignorance, the whale just has to eat because she's compelled to eat animals because that's all that's there. Due to her past karma, she's born as a whale. Due to their karma, they're born to be breakfast for the whale. So this whole vicious cycle of samsara continues, you know. So you deeply regret, you deeply have, you regret it first, and now you have compassion for all those sentient beings you've harmed without realizing it. Such compassion. And you wish you must purify for their sake. Third step, you do a practice. So this is sort of applying the antidote. Well, in ordinary life, that could be doing anything. If you, you know, the antidote, the simplest antidote to, to killing is to try and save a life. The simplest antidote is to help others. The antidote to lying is to tell the truth. We must do this anyway. But this particular meditation practice, that all the lamas praise it as one of the most potent practices in itself. So then you do a particular visualization of this Buddha, Vajrasattva, reciting these mantras and imagining this process of purifying that's a whole little meditation, this third step. And then the fourth step, as Pabonka Rinpoche says, the most important, which is what the fishermen didn't, hadn't done, which was all the people killing on this planet right now haven't done in the past, but which the person, the little boy with compassion for the lice must have done logically. That is to vow never to kill again, to vow never to lie again, never to steal again. You don't lie to yourself. Like if I'm going to badmouth Douglas 20 times a day, I don't vow never to badmouth him again. It's too, it's, I can't, I'm not, I'm not capable. So I might vow not to badmouth him for one hour. You start small. So this is powerful because this whole process is a process of taking responsibility. The first one, Lama Zopa says that's the most important, the regretting, the owning, and the deeply regretting because you can't bear the suffering. If you don't do that step first, you can't go to the rest of the steps and you'll never do the step of vowing not to do it again. So it's really powerful psychologically and very practical. But our trouble is it's done often in the context of a holy practice with your bells and everything. So we just, we just read the words mindlessly. So I think it's so important to do it personally, privately, in your own words, meaning it sincerely. Because it's really like this practice is like becoming your own friend. I mean that sincerely, you know. Often we do our practices mindlessly. We've got to really mean these words. Because the Buddha's point is every single thought we have is the process of, puri- of, pr- of, of producing and purifying ourselves. It's not just empty words. We think thoughts have no meaning. This is beyond nihilistic. We really don't think thoughts count. I can think what I like, we say. It's beyond shocking. The Buddha says literally every thought counts. Literally every thought sows a seed. So every thought is part of the process of fixing yourself. So it's marvelous. And so as Lama Yeshi says, we should do this at the end of every day. Insane not to do it every day, Lama Zoba says. And Lama Yeshi said, when we do it every day, we go to bed with a happy mind. So we just <coughs> refrain, lived in vows of no killing. This is extra level to live in the vows. And then purified every day and did a little bit of practice as well, as well as keeping your other commitments. You don't have to do anything more. But our trouble is we get all excited and do one hour of doing shamatha every day, even though we haven't committed to do it, but we don't keep our, ta- we don't keep our vows, don't keep our commitments. It's like insane, demented, ridiculous. Whereas if you keep your commitments bare bones, you keep your word of honor, you keep this connection with, your holy, with the Buddhas, with the holy beings whom you've committed to, you keep that connection alive, you keep your practice alive, you know, then it, you will die with a happy mind and keep on moving in your path to enlightenment. <coughs> Time to go home. Four o'clock. Any questions before we go home? Yeah. Uh, You've talked about ignorance in the context of the mouse and yes. the whale. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you can clarify the role of ignorance in <coughs> creating karma, because in the context of the whale, it sounded like ignorance can lead to creating negative karma. Absolutely. Oh, okay, it's, well, it, it, this ignorance is a very broad word, unfortunately. But, I mean, the general ignorance, meaning not knowing the consequences of actions we do. In ordinary life, we see that, don't we? I mean, even in the 60s, when I smoked masses of cigarettes, like my 40 to 60 to 80 sometimes Marlboros, and I'm serious, I did, in between the marijuana and the speed, and the speed. 
At my worst. That's exaggerating. Um, that was my worst. I didn't know about can- lung cancer. So in a simple sense, out of ordinary ignorance, I didn't know the consequences of my actions. And that's a very common ignorance that we have in daily life, isn't it? I'm ignorant. And that can cause incredible problems, can't it? So here the Buddha's view about ignorance is ignorance of this process of cause and effect, which he says is a natural law that goes from life to life to life to life. So then, you know, if you're a whale, excuse me, all due respect to wonderful whales, there's no kind of, a, there's no intellectual understanding of a concept called karma. And it's just due to past karma of killing, it's born as a whale. And then it's due to past habit of killing, it, it's lived in, a, in an ocean that's full of breakfast and they happen to be living beings. What choice do you have? It's kind of, you're stuck in it, isn't it? So this is kind of incredible due to ignorance from the past. You're born in this situation. And then due to profound ignorance now, you keep creating more nightmares for yourself. So there's this regular old ignorance of cause and effect. And then, of course, there's a deeper ignorance, which we haven't even got into today, but that's the main one. So in that sense, we all know ourselves if cause and effect in anything in daily life. If we don't know all the consequences of something, we're going to be in trouble. Just in that sense. Does that make sense? So then to have compassion for ourselves. That's why with regret. Like, you know, I always use the example of me when I was 23, I had an abortion. So, you know, I take the Buddhist view that that was a sentient being, a human being from the second of conception. A consciousness came into my womb at that time and it was a human being and then I decided to have an abortion. So I take that as my example. That I, so I, I didn't, at that time, even though I'd been a Catholic, I, I wasn't then, but I had, I had no thought of it being a being. I just knew I didn't want the thing that came out the other end, which is a thing with legs and arms. But I didn't think of what it was all the way through. So I just knew I didn't want it. Very clear. So I could say I was ignorant. I didn't, I didn't, you know, volitionally say this is a human being and I hate human beings. I'm going to kill it. That would have been heavier. I was just dumb and idiotic and a habit came and I just had the abortion. I even got depressed. I remember when I had it, I never got depressed. So you can say that's literally ignorance. So I happily regret that now. I didn't know. I didn't know at the dumb time. I followed some instinct, some habit. I didn't think it through. I didn't think of the consequences, meaning to myself. So I did a thing called killing. So I regret it. So every time I do that, then I have compassion for the being. I try to purify it and I vow not to do it again. So all of the actions like that. It's a very practical process, you know. Do you understand? Is that a question coming, Doug? When... I was at Laudo with you recently. Yes. Did you puff and pant up the mountain and die to come back, or did you enjoy it? Yes. Oh, both. (laughs) (laughs) Go on, Doug. Go Um, on. I was very... I had heard from others before we went that even if you'd had challenges doing meditations before, Mm. that it would be very auspicious to be able to do meditations there. That's right. Um... I'm naturally skeptical. Naturally, of course, that's right. Um, That's good. The first time I tried it, there was nothing. The third night, it was magical. Oh, was it? (laughs) I'm I'm still skeptical. How do I rationalize? Well, yeah, I know, but skeptical about precisely what point, Doug? Skeptical about what it was that... Oh, you mean why you're sitting in a... Okay, you mean why a certain place can be quote-unquote blessed is what you're saying. Correct. Well, Doug, one of the simplest points would be that, you know, for the Buddhists, as you're hearing, there are billions of beings existing who have accomplished Buddhahood already. They're real consciousnesses that don't need a body, that they're already existing and they're all floating about. Literally like that. So if you've been a Catholic, you know all about the angels and everything. It's a bit similar. But, you've got, but to take that view as a Buddhist, you've got to take the assumption that there are billions of consciousnesses, many beings who have created, who already are perfect, but aren't in a human form or a dog form or in a yak form. But they're in a subtle body. They don't have a physical body. But, and this is the point about, have you ever been in places where the energy was very heavy? Negative. Huh? Neg- heavy, yeah, negative. Well, that the Buddhist view would be, let's say when you're a place where there's masses of attachment, like around where there are lots of junkies or alcoholics. Well, even physically, it looks like pretty dumpy, doesn't it? F- there you go. So physically, it looks pretty terrible. So the Buddhist view is when there's masses of suffering and masses of attachment and masses of aggression in the minds of the beings, that attracts lots of suffering beings to be around, hovering all around. So it's really like you heal the, feel the heavy energy, you know? That's called spirits and unhappy beings. So you've got to take that as a view. So that, if nothing else, that's a, the, the reason for it. So you've got to, just got to posit that possibility, that's all. So it's not mystical. It is, there are many holy, like, you know, those, when, we, when, when you went up without me and you did the business, you stopped for Harry, Harry when he fell off the mountain. Well, that kind of thing. That's beings who, who are in a human body but can manifest their mind to do that kind of thing. So that's, all you can do is listen to the teachings and hear that and posit that as a possibility. 
not to believe it, but just th th there is logic to all of it. We have to know how to put it, though. That's all. Falling off the mountain right there, I could have easily found. What? Say it again. Falling off the mountain right there, I could have easily found very logical. There you go. That's true. Exactly that. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Who else, people, before we go home? Any more? Who's that? Sp talk to me, sweetheart. Um, uh, you say the pe people ourselves, and we have uh, karmic seeds in our karmic bag and our karmic bulk. Um, and then the animals also have theirs, whether or not they are aware of it. Yes, that's right. Um, how does that apply to the world or the earth? Yes. You know, a lot of people believe the, the world is... Oh, the physical earth itself. I see. No, I understand. They're very good. So I'll just study the Buddhist view, okay? There's, in the universe's universe, there is matter, which is physical, made of the four elements. That's the view we used to have back in the Middle Ages in the time of Galileo. Now we've got other kinds of elements, haven't we? There's the matter, which is the four elements, and then there is minds, and that's it. So and interestingly now, just to say a bit more here. So in the, in the Vajrayana teachings, in the more esoteric teachings in Buddhism, which is the same system that the Tibetan medical system is based on, and I mentioned it briefly before, that there are these, there's the four elements. Each, okay, each of us is, you, John, you're John, eh? So John has got a body, which is the four elements, they say, and then he's got a consciousness, and these are inextricably linked. So due to your past, so okay, so the, you've got subtle physical elements as well. And the Tibetan doctors, like I mentioned, when they feel your pulses, they feel the subtler level of your physical energy, which is all these wind energies that are intimately connected to all your states of mind, intimately connected. So, and this affects impacts upon your grosser body. So then, so okay, so Lama Zopa said one, this is helping us try to comprehend the environmental business, the environmental karma I mentioned briefly before. Lama Zopa said in the Kala Chakra Tantra teachings, all those teachings, there are these detailed descriptions of the intimate relationship between internal and external energies. And what that means is internal is mind in terms of John, and then external is your physical elements. So they have a very subtle level, a grosser level, and a very gross level, if you like. And the, the grosser level, is manifesting as this body we call John's body. Your mind is, com and your body is completely imbued with this consciousness, not just like in our brain, the way we think in the West, but all of your physical body is imbued with consciousness throughout in a really sophisticated way, and it's all described in these texts. Okay, so this is what Lama Zopa said. When your mind, let's say, is negative, you have anger. Because that anger is linked to its own wind energies, that naturally pollutes the wind energies. So that in turn karmically causes you to be sick, to get sickness. So that, that's literally the cause of why you're born, even in a, even this life, you get sick. If you're angry and jealous and resentful and bitter and kill and lie, let's say lots and lots of negative mental energy carried out as well with your body and speech, then you mightn't get sick now, but you're polluting those wind energies as either in this life or the future. That is the cause of you to have a really sick body. Because these wind energies, very subtle level, are carried on after this life and take all those karmic imprints and then that'll manifest in the next body you have, literally in Buddhist teachings. So equally... If you and then in turn, the longer time in turn, uh, those negative uh, actions you did, which have polluted your wind energies, in turn impact upon the external elements, and that will cause you to get born, let's say, in an environment where the where the elements are completely messed up, where there's where there's pollution and rubbish. This is the karmic result of the collective karma of all those people, not just John, who are born in that situation where the elements are a mess, where you have volcanoes or 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 pollution or whatever it might be. It's highly sophisticated the way it all works, but it's all described in this way. So there's getting to the point. There is only physical matter and there is mental. but So physical, by definition, is merely the four elements, and it doesn't, in its nature, is not a, a consciousness. It doesn't have its own life. It doesn't have its own karma. It's only minds that create karma. So you can even argue, too, that wherever there is physical matter, wherever the four elements are, that's a conducive environment for sentient beings to be there. So we all know even our body is like a walking zoo, isn't it? There are billions of creatures in our body, living beings. And the, even in matter, in flowers and rocks, there are many living beings there. So it's almost like there are consciousnesses, but the matter itself doesn't have a con is not a consciousness itself. That's the Buddhist explanation. It's a long explanation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. What else, people, before we go home? So much we talked about, but so much was left in the air as well, isn't it? So we'll have to leave it there. Food for thought. But remember, there's not a millisecond of anything we've said and thought. We might remember 99% of it. I don't. 
but it's all gone in, okay? So be happy about that. So all, two things. It's two, there's the actual, like Keshitashi said, we, it's like we're shooting movie all day. So just merely all the things we've heard have all gone in as a memory. The other one is the qualitative one of creating karma based on motivation and the seeds that we've planted in what we've been listening to and thinking about. So we delight in either way. We've been growing a garden all day. We've been weeding and growing flowers. How fantastic. Be delighted. So make the aspiration that we never give up, nourishing these seeds we've planted so that we can develop our amazing potential in, you know, be finding the purpose of developing our own amazing mind for our own sake and for the sake of others so we can help others. This is the bottom line. No matter what methods you use, I don't care. You become a Mickey Mouseist. I don't mind what it is. Use the methods that help you develop your own qualities and help others. Bottom line, you know. We just sing a couple of little prayers that express that dedication. And the other little prayer just expresses the aspiration that bodhicitta, this amazing kind of le- uh, as- the amazing aspiration to be a benefit to others, never, never stops. Okay. Okay. Kewadi nyu du dag Lama sangge drub gyune Drowa chi kyang malupa Dei sala kepa shok Jang chub sem chog rin po che Ma ke pa nam ke gyo chig Ke pa nyam pa me pa yang Gong ne gong du pa va shok And may we never develop even for a moment wrong views towards the deeds of our most precious lamas. With faith and respect gained from seeing their goodness may their full inspiration flow into our hearts. Thank you everybody very much. See you somewhere. See you in the see you in the sky with Lama Yeshi would say. <laughs> and don't forget Lama Yeshi's amazing, wonderful, precious book on Mahamudra, How to Meditate on Emptiness. How to meditate and how to realise emptiness. Coming out in September. So precious.